This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good afternoon everybody and welcome to this the sunset safari on this glorious Sunday afternoon. I think it's the 15th of April halfway through if you can believe it. Fergus is on camera. There you are, you saw my name there, it's James Hendry in case you're illiterate and in the final control we've got Rebecca on the Vox and on the keys I think we have still got the long-suffering Lucas. Anyway, uh, on the other vehicles we have Taylor and Brent, there was some fear of uh, rain, believe it or not, a little earlier, it was raining. from hot I couldn't possibly tell you anyway send us your questions or comments on this easy going Sunday afternoon hashtags for our live or on the chat stream on YouTube and we'll do our level best to answer them and entertain you for the next three hours or so we are in the low felt of South Africa that means the lowlands we're about 400 meters above sea level on the eastern edge of the Drakensberg escarpment. Well, we're down in the bowl of the Drakensberg escarpment. And off to the east goes the Mozambican plains and out to the Indian Ocean about 200 kilometers away. So that's where we find ourselves on planet Earth. While I drive up towards a waterhole not too far from here, let's go across to Taylor McCurdy, who is, uh, I don't know what she's doing. I think everybody thinks I'm trying to get off work to me at the beginning of the show. My name is Taylor and I am not a slacker and on camera with me today is Senzor and we are sitting at a treehouse dam. I don't know why Bexar signal is being strange, really the gremlins are trying to get us, but remember you can chat to us and I look forward to having conversations with all of you and hopefully we're going to find some animals to have some conversations about because at the moment there's not even any blacksmith lapwing at Treehouse Dam. It's very quiet, so I'm going to suggest that we're going to do birding today and then by hopefully some miracle, some animals are going to jump out and we're going to find them. Maybe the elephants decide to return, perhaps a journey of giraffe pass on through Juma, who knows? The options are endless, is what we could see today. But, um, but yeah, so it's a little bit on the quiet side. It's been a weird day. There's been rain, there's been sun, as you can see, there's blue sky, and then a cloud would come over and it would rain on us and then it would move away and then it would be beautiful and go sun tanning and then you'd have to put a jacket and a scarf and a beanie on because the weather would be t and now it's, it's beautiful again. It's really quite lovely, but sadly this is all we have here. Rebecca, please may I drive? <laughs> I'm going to drive. I don't know why the gremlins are attack attacking us. I think I can see some warthogs, so we're going to try and get a bit closer to them. They're down over there. I saw them feeding in the grass, but a bit too far away. Oh my goodness. We are not being attacked by signal gremlins. Can you believe it? Well, hold your breaths here. Because we went a little bit downhill, but we're going back up again. Are we still here? You might be one of those drives. Okay, warthogs, where are you? I saw you. I saw them moving. But where did I see them? Oh, it's too far away. Eh, I don't think we're going to be able to see the warthogs. That would have been so cool to see them off the bat. Let me go a little bit further. Oh, goodness, right? And Jigger, he's zooming away. Uh -uh. Okay, sadly, no warthogs for us. They've run back into the tall grass, and you, you've seen what the grass is like in this area. And it's not very nice for looking at small animals, especially when, if they have to see over the grass, and some of you may remember uh, from the Mara, how the warthogs used to literally walk with their noses in the air like this, trying to desperately see over that tall grass to make sure they didn't walk into a lioness. Anyways, I don't think those uh, warthogs will be walking into a lioness, but James has some warthogs, and maybe they will trot into some cats. Uh, I don't think they'll walk into some cats, or he will walk into some cats. Um, it's possible, though. Of course, this uh, youngish male warthog, favoured food of the likes of Hokomori. Now, the reason we've come up here is that we can hear some elephants shouting off away to the... Why can I never get east and west right the first time round? Off to the west. And I think they're coming up towards Sydney's waterhole. 
So we might be lucky and see them come down for a drinky. Gorgeous, gorgeous afternoon. I was just saying to Fagusto that this is the most wonderful time of year in many parts of South Africa. He, of course, lives in Cape Town, lamentable, lamentable settlement, but for this time of year, when the wind stops blowing uh, for about two weeks, uh, where my parents live in the Eastern Cape, also the wind tends to blow a bit, but this time of year, just glorious. And around here, of course, the edge of the summer has come off which means that while it's a beautiful warm day, probably around 29 degrees or so, I think they said, which is about 84, 85 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, although it's, you know, it's very pleasant to be out in, one doesn't feel like one's cooking like one does in the middle of summer. Beautiful. All right, we're going to stay with this warthog. Taylor has a small bird that she wants to show you quickly. Let's go across there. We've got cuckoos. We've got two cuckoos, in fact. They are, I think. Can you turn and look this way, please? Do you have a striped body or do you have no stripes? I think I did see some stripes on the throat there, so that would make it a levalence cuckoo, which is pretty cool. And there's a pair of them. Now, I suspect that they've hopped into this quarry tree looking for caterpillars because, well, caterpillars are the favorite food of the cuckoo species of birds. I'm trying to see where the other one has gone now. It has flown away. I don't want to start the car and move it because I know what's going to happen is that it is just going to dis disappear. Now, there are two cuckoos that look very similar to one another, and that is the Jacobins and the Levalens, but I have not seen the breast of this one just yet. Oh, it's still there. There you go. It's actually in a better spot now. Please turn around. Cuckoo. Cuckoo. I'm joking. That bird does not make that sound. <laughs> this is the sound of a Levalens cuckoo as I play, I'll play it softly. Yeah, that's definitely... A levalence. So that's not that bird calling. That's me very quickly just playing the call so that you can hear it. Very nice. And anyways, these birds are migrants. They are intra-African migrants, so I don't think they're going to be here for too much longer. Just like everybody else, they typically arrive towards the end of the year, the start of summer. And, oh, thank you. You're being very polite. And then they normally linger around for a wee bit and should theoretically start heading north. Oh, there's another cuckoo calling in the far distance. Should start heading north now, April, May. This is quite cool. Nice to see them around. We don't often get to have amazing sightings of, of the cuckoos. Yeah, there is another cuckoo calling in the far distance. So you can see that bird is listening to it. I think it's now responding to the call behind us and going. Anyways, okay, well, that was quite nice, hey? Very nice little sighting. Very, well, actually, it wasn't a brief sighting. It was a long sighting. I'm trying to what the second one when. It's been a Sorry about that rather sudden departure from Taylor's cuckoo. I don't know what it is, but I'm, what I'm, I'm going to guess is that it was a striped cuckoo because a lot of the striped cuckoos stay their first year here. They don't migrate. And while their parents disappear, they stay here. But of course, they've never met their parents. They stay with their babblers. It was a levalence cuckoo, apparently, which, uh, unsurprisingly, is also the striped cuckoo. What a stroke of luck. A striped cuckoo is the old name. And they often stay with their babbler friends. Well, friends. See, now you're wondering if I've ever seen a leopard attack a warthog. Uh, I think I've seen leopard try to attack warthogs. I've never seen a leopard successfully attack and kill a warthog. Have I misidentified the sex of this hog? I think it might be a lady hog. Nah, 
I think it's a lady hog. Yes, it is a lady hog. I've just looked at the face now. I do apologize, everybody. It's a lady hog. Not a male. Anyway, what I'm going to try and do is sneak a little bit closer. The hogs here tend to be very unconfiding, as I've said, but this one seems to be okay, so I'll just try and ease forward, which of course is difficult in a vehicle that makes the amount of noise that these ones do, but let's try. So that we can get this bush out the way. I'll probably hit a stump or something and give it a terrible fright. Ooh, and there's an impala just behind. The ultimate two-shot. Sharia, you want to know why the warthog is kneeling? Well, I'm afraid, Sharia, you provide me with the opportunity to give you a silly answer um, because of the day, and so I'm going to, and then I'm going to... Well, I'm going to apologize in advance for giving you a silly answer. Um, <laughs> it's because it's Sunday, of course. It was praying. That's why it was on its knees. Uh, no, that's a silly answer. They graze on their knees because they have to dig out the rhizomes, which are the underground stems and sort of storage vaults of energy that the grasses produce. And they've got a very hard cartilaginous plate in the front of their noses, and that helps them uh, to dig. And so when there's something particularly nice that they want underneath the soil, they'll get onto their knees and then dig it up. So that's why. It was on its knees. It's not a particularly religious warthog, as far as I can tell. Although, if, if it was to see Hukumori, it would certainly be. Sinek, you want to know if warthogs eat meat at all? Yes, they do sometimes. In fact, this, in fact, a female warthog like this one could easily be found scavenging off a carcass from time to time especially if she was pregnant or if she had youngsters and she just needed a bit of extra nutri nutrition so calcium or phosphorus or maybe even a little bit of protein so it would not be unusual or it wouldn't be surprising to find her uh, supping on some bones or some rotting flesh and certainly her closest relative the bush pig are known to be omnivorous they will eat meat readily She's got a wonderful set of tusks, I must say. That's why I mistook her for a boar to start with. All right, let's go across to Brent Leo Smith. You haven't seen him yet this afternoon. He's on his way to Chitwa, Chitwa. Hello! Yes, sorry, we had a few... ...as we were getting started, so we got out a little bit late. Oh my goodness. Apologies, everybody. You're just going to have to, well, grin and bear with us today. It's going to be one of those technical gremlin infested shows. Get your fly swatters out, your bug spray, all these wonderful things. Ooh, okay, I'm just checking the clock. Sharindra, it is 3.43 p.m. Central African time right now. That's what time it is, and um, it's lovely. It's very nice. It's my favorite time of the day, 3.43, exactly. Um, normally, this is when I'm out on safari. But who knows where I could be on the beach? Maybe riding a horse? I don't know. Senzo, what would you be doing at 3.43 if you weren't at work? I can only... I'm going to bounce across to James. We do seem to be making a few um, uh, sudden arrivals with us. We've now got very, very close to our hog friend. She's not a youngster. She's fairly old, I would say, from the grey hair that she has. And she's, been tr she's the best warthog I've ever met. I can't believe how confiding she's being. She's seen it all before, you see. 
and you can tell that from the magnificence of her tusks. And maybe you can just see the wind flickering through the grass stalks there. Very gentle breeze coming out of the southeast. And you might be able to hear one or two robins calling off to the west. I nearly said east again. The white browed scrub robins. Oh, dear, what's the matter? Something got into her nose, literally. Madam Hogg? What troubles thee, such? So... No, Willie, you're absolutely right. In fact, it's the same applies to just about anything out here. You say it's not very easy to reach old age. Uh, it certainly isn't. And the fact that she's got so far, I think, indicates that she's uh, wily and picked a good place to live. I think I've seen her around here before uh, many times and I think she's had a number of litters around here and I suspect her success has quite a lot to do with the openness of where she lives and the shortness of the grass which means that although she ain't tall she can still see over the short grass at what is coming to eat her and her babies. Good, let us move along. I'm warthogged out for the day. Not sure how good our signal is going to be down here. We did hear some elephants, and I guessed to hear, but I feel like I've guessed. I bet James is going, ha, 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 payback, because of <laughs> all the technical gremlins he had. Right, let's stop. Let's be serious now. Let's not talk about those anymore. Okay, no, sorry, everybody. Please bear with us. We aren't trying to work on certain things. Now, I'm hoping that we are going to find Hosanna, and he's just going to pop out and... Okie dokie, everybody. Right, I've got a very important announcement to make. Uh, I'm apologizing on behalf of all of everybody, of all of everybody, because that's how sorry we are that we're having these technical gremlins today. We're going to be going to Tech Loop so that we can try and sort the issues out. So we'll be back with you shortly.
And back we are, everybody. Sorry about these technical glitches, you know. Everything gets to have a bit of a holiday, and the technical staff seems to be having a holiday today. Rest assured, our technical staff are not having a holiday at all today. They're working like slaves, trying to get everything fixed up for the rest of the show. These are impala, in case you've just joined us. The most common antelope in all of South Africa. Not the national antelope. We don't have a national antelope. We have a national uh, gazelle, which I suppose is an antelope, actually. And that is the springbok, which does not occur here. They are replaced ecologically by the impala. Very strange kind of weather. As Fergus was saying, we are surrounded on all sides by massive builds up build ups builds up build ups of cloud and we seem to be in the eye of the storm under a beautiful gre green sky beautiful blue sky it is blue that's the sky isn't it it's green that's the the vegetation yeah, i think just doing a handstand. yes i'm doing a handstand good point we didn't find the elephants i'm afraid everybody not that we've looked particularly hard. We've been enjoying the atmosphere of this gorgeous afternoon. All right, now it would appear that Brent Leo Smith has managed to go to Chitra Chitra. He's done something called power cycling. I've got no idea what that means, but I've no doubt he will tell you all about it now. I don't know what it means either. Viem did it. Afternoon, I'm Brent, and Viem's on camera. Hopefully this time we're able to say hello properly. Uh, we're in one of my favorite little spots at Chitwa. Uh, we're just behind the dam wall looking for any sign of Tengana or Hosanna. Both like to frequent this area, and you'll see we do, even though the sun is out, it was raining when we left, so <laughs> we had to put on our rain roof. Viem, is that kingfisher low enough that the roof is not... No, the roof is going to... <laughs> Uh, anyway, that is what it is. Let me just try and move so Viem can possibly get a little, looks like brown hooded kingfisher. If he doesn't fly away as we move a bit closer. Also looking, oh, for some baby crocodiles. This is a good spot for them. The kingfisher's still there. Oh, he's gone. And let's have a look. I thought I saw a baby croc moving. Just have a look. Look, yeah. That is not a croc. That looks like a bit of mud, isn't it? Or a stick. Oh, sometimes it pays to just sit and wait a little bit. They, they pop their little heads up. But as I say, we're looking for any sign of Hosanna or Tengana. Uh, Hassan has been in Chitwa camp uh, on a kill right between the guest rooms again. He seems to like that. Oh, you see that grass moving there? Is there a crocodile there? Mm -hmm. Now, I think we should have a little Sunday afternoon challenge. And uh, what we're going to do is see how many mammal species we can see this afternoon. So, of course, we will stop for reptiles like crocodiles and birdies as well. But I think... We're going to go and see how many different mammals we can get this afternoon. I'm hoping, how many do you think we can get, Vim? Nine. Nine? I think we can do better. Oh, black craig, Vim. I think we can do better than nine. Oh, disappearing craig. I have not checked out the barn owl nest recently, Brent. It's not too far from here, so maybe we will have a squiz there. Oh, there we go. The crake's on the fallen log now. Come on. There he is. This is the, definitely the best spot to see black crakes uh, around here, even though this one is being very sneaky and shy. It's also the best spot to normally see Tingana. Okay. So, nine. I think we're going to start off with at least five mammal species around Chitra Dam. Yeah, so I think nine, I think nine is 
is doable. I think if we got to 15, I'd be really impressed. Managed 15 different mammals in a drive. That would be pretty awesome. So I think we're definitely going to get water buck around here. We're definitely going to get a parlor. We're definitely going to get kudu. I mean, not kudu, uh, hippo. Kudu we should get. In Yala we should get. Well, instead of rattling off, let's see how many we can get on camera. I'm hoping leopard will be one of one of the ones we get. Either Hosana or Tingana or Kuchava. Now, one mammal we might not get, Sally, is giraffe. Uh, we don't actually have large giraffe populations in this part of the Sabi Sands, as they favorite trees are not oh they're, they're around but they're not very common so they prefer acacia dominant woodland where we are in combretum dominant woodland they are around uh, actually around just below Chitwe has actually a good spot there's a big male that we see quite often around here so there's always a chance but no we don't see them that often I would probably go as far as say them that we see leopard more often than we see giraffe yeah, I think that's quite a safe assumption. They say we see more leopard than we see giraffe. And now there's not many places in the world you can claim that, that you see more leopard than giraffe. And that's what makes this area so ex exquisite. Okay, let us climb up onto the wall and get our mammal challenge on the go. And as I said, I think we're going to start off with at least four species. So there we go. Oh, apparently you're stuck with us guys and uh, we're having still having a bit of a uh, tech difficulties but you have us there we go hippos is our first mammal of the day so there's one hippos number two impala and this is quite quite confident we'd get hippo and impala and of course water buck that's three now I'm surprised. Can I see? Where are my binoculars? There's always maybe a bit later in the evening. It might be a good spot for come back and see if we can get bushbuck and inyala. Just go behind. There's some waterbuck. Can you see those waterbuck? Now behind the waterbuck, there's something orange to the right a bit. There we go. Oh, a little bit to the left. There we go. That is an inyala hiding there and the, just on the edge of the shade. So what are we on now? Four. Eh, that's not a bad start to our mammal challenge. Four different species. Liam thinks we're going to get nine. I'm hoping for 12, but if we get 15, well, I'll be very impressed. Uh, always worth having a quick and closer look around the edges of the dam here for, for bushbuck as well. And of course, the gorgeous Chitwa Chitwa Lodge. It is in a prime spot. I mean, they're right around where all the leopards and the lions like to hang about often. Oh, what's going on over there? You see, see that? Yes, yeah, so well, Vim's on it. Oh, whoa, it's all going on. What? Why would you do that, Hippo? The Hippo decided to chase the... Chase the, um... Egyptian geese. Why are those water buck running so... I wonder if that was the male chasing them around. Feeling a bit frisky. Let's go have a look in that area and see what's happening there. Maybe Hosanna is causing havoc. Uh, sorry. Now... Uh, I'm, let me just turn that, Costa, thank you, thank you, Costa is, uh, Costa, the highest concentration of leopards is quite a difficult one, um, the highest concentrations of, of leopards in Africa that I know of is, in, is supposed to be the, the Luangwa Valley in Zambia, uh, but I think the highest concentration of, uh, of leopards in the world uh, not just in Africa, is Sri Lanka. Um, one of the, the parks in Sri Lanka, I'm try I can't remember which one, is said to have the highest 
concentration of leopards in the world. Okay. So what are we on now? We're at Hippo, Impala, Inyala, Waterbuck. Is that all? We have four. Sure we don't have a fifth one? Uh, I said that Waterbuck ran out of that top section of the dam. And still staring. There's one Waterbuck still staring there. But I said it could have been the male chasing about the females. You see, Vian spotted a crocodile. Where are you looking, Vimpy? Oh, wow. I'm just looking far away, but there's a big croc basking. Now, as we get further and further into the winter months, we are going to see these crocs basking uh, more and more. As it, it's quite chilly. That's one of the big, who's that, Vlad or Boris, Boris the Blade or Vlad the Impaler. Now that crocodile is plenty big enough to chomp on a human being. There's quite a strong wind this, this, this afternoon which is making my hearing a bit... Well, I have to concentrate a bit more. Now, we think there might be some cloud rolling in. I'm going to go have a look in that little top corner to see if it was Hassana that was causing havoc amongst the waterbuck. In the meantime, James is going to show you that cloud bank that's rolling in. Yes, we are sitting with an enormous cloud bank here, and there's another enormous cloud bank off to the south and east of the one you're looking at now. Fergus and I are just trying to get beyond this bush so that we can show it to you. Magnificent cloud formations. I mean, that is just spectacular, isn't it? Now, not a great deal of leopards hanging from underneath it, but uh, it is magnificent nevertheless. Mm. Gorgeous. Yes, one almost expects God to be sitting there on his throne. Fantastic. I mean, that really is spectacular. Now, that's a big cumulonimbus cloud. A big thunderhead, as I think they're called in some parts of the world. And one would expect it to produce quite a lot of lightning and thunder. None of which I can hear. Well, I can't, you can never hear lightning. You can certainly see it. I can't see or hear any lightning or thunder now. I've taken a number of illegal photographs. So brave am I. Laurie, you say that that cloud looks like a hippo. Laurie, I'm staring hard at that cloud, and a hippo, I'm afraid, I'm failing to discern. Can you see a hippo, Fergus? Fergus says it looks like a nuclear bomb. And apparently that's what Conrad and Jared in the final control said as well. Well, quite. Hmm. It really is very pretty. Anyway, there's another one off to the other side. And I think we'll have one look at that. Have a quick see if there isn't any rain falling underneath it. And then we'll continue on our merry way. Beautiful. All righty, let's go from this massive macro-scale cloud down to a micro-micro-mammal.
Yes, a micro mammal, but it is definitely a mammal for our mammal list. Oh, there it goes. A squirrel. Then if we go up onto the left, there we go. Some more micro mammals. A little bit lower. Where do you go? Oh dear. Did they disappear? There we go. Look at that. Another micro mammal. The dwarf mongoose. Aren't they cute? I can hear them just... Oh, there's one closer to us here, Vimpy, on the sand. Giving us that little look out. Uh, they are one of my favorite little creatures, the dwarf mongoose. Isn't that cute? Now, it's the smallest member of the order carnivora. So, in theory, it's the smallest carnivore in Africa. Even though they are mostly insectivores. Oh, it sounds like the fish eagle just arrived and caused absolute pandemonium behind us. Just heard all the birds explode and the hardy dies. So, that sounds like a fish eagle. When the fish eagle arrives at the dam, they tend to panic like that. Oh, our dwarf mongoose has disappeared. But so, they are, they've got very, very complex social structures. Let me just try to see if we can get another view of a dwarf mongoose, because our squirrels disappeared. And he's still hiding in there. Here we are. <laughs> no, into the grass. And uh, it's quite lucky to see them out in the open like this. Quite often they'll skedaddle. We do have some very nice, re relaxed groups, though. Now, they're one of the only animals that will love each other instead of fighting. So, see in that little, ah, uh, that tree fall there. There's a lot of them up there. There we go. There's some more heading up the road. They are so cute. And as I was saying, so they, they will actually have a love off. So they've got a very similar sort of social structure to something like an African wild dog when they have an alpha pair that does all the breeding and then the rest of the individuals in the, in the business, which is the collective noun for a group of mongoose, will look after the, 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 the I suppose they mongoose pups, cubs, moglets, monglets, um, coast spider, yes, uh, most, most mongoose species will fight snakes um, and eat snakes. However, the dwarf mongoose will generally try to avoid most snakes because they're so small, unless there's a small, I don't know, what is, when was there a lion around here? There's old tracks, but there's male lion tracks. They're not very fresh, unfortunately. Um, so yes, they will. They will try fight snakes and chase snakes. Oh, very on. You see on the little gardenia, there's a little fire finch. Oh, come on, fire finches. They're one of the hardest birds to get on camera. They're very, very pretty. And just popped into the grass there. Darn it! You can hear the tiny little teet 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 from all the little seed eaters. So things like. Uh, Things like uh, wax bulls and and fire finches and the squirrel making a noise. Okay. I think he's just talking to other squirrels there. Or not? And you see him? He is there. What have you spotted that has made you upset, squirrel? So that is an alarm call, but I can't see what it's alarming at. Not a very serious one, though. So when they're really serious, their tails make... Oh, let me just... So as I say, you never know, Ald, Hosanna has been spending quite a bit of time in the lodge itself. And the boundary of the lodge is not more than 100 meters from us here. 
So that's a squirrel. You never know if Hassan has heard me talking and decided to come investigate because he's bored. Squirrel? You're looking in here, but I don't see anything. And the dwarf mongoose aren't alarm calling either. Maybe it's just a paranoid squirrel. I'd also be paranoid if I was a squirrel with everything trying to eat me all the time. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to do a sort of big loop around the lodge, see if any leopard tracks come out of the lodge area, well, mostly Hasana, and also see if we can find any tracks of the old man Tingana. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not sure what happened there, Rebecca. Rebecca, are we still live? I just heard crash cut, crash cut live. Oh, I've got so I got a fright there. Oh, anyway. oh I, got, I, got, I got so confused. So <laughs> we're going to go across to James without a crash cut. Now I get it. Let's go see what Master Henry's plans are. Hooray, no crash cut, yippee. Um, we have failed to find anything remotely resembling a mammal, so we'll look at an arachnid as instead. Uh, an, an arachnid that I've shown you on bushwalk the other day. But I needed to get out of the car and stretch my legs now, so I thought I would go across and show you. The beautiful golden orbweb spider. So few of them have there been this season, or last season. You can see it, can you, Fergus? Uh, I spiked myself. Now this lady is the same size as the one that I saw before. She's not very big. They get about twice that size. And if I put my hand up behind her, you can kind of see that she's this, oh, almost the same size if she stretched her leggies out, but they can be about twice that size. Ah, now this is what I was looking for. That one there, just below my fingers, is the male. There he is. And he's missing a leg. It's not unusual. Often the males are missing legs. They get into tussles with their wives, which often result in their being eaten. This one has just lost himself a limb. So those of you who think you have marital troubles, uh, bear in mind that hopefully well, it's not as bad as it is uh, with the golden orb spider. And then, of course, the ubiquitous mercury drop or dew drop spider that likes to steal food from this rather intimidating looking but utterly harmless and gorgeous spider lady. She's caught herself lots of beetles, lots of flies, and in one case I think, oh, she's actually caught herself a jewel beetle that she's attached to this kind of bird warning device here. There's a jewel beetle there. I'll just bring that across to you. Madam, I'm taking a piece of your uh, your um, warning device. Is that all right? The rest I shall leave intact. There you are. Thank you. As you were. Here I come. sun to shine on it pretty much. I think it was a jewel beetle here. You see it there? How's that, Ferg? Gorgeous iridescent colours. So I think a jewel beetle. Initially I thought a cuckoo wasp, but this one's got elytra and it is therefore a beetle. Okay, good. 
Let's move on. We're going towards Gallagher Pan now. We found nothing up in the northeast, west, northwest. So we'll go into the centre. I believe Taylor has made it all the way to Beef Hook Dam. Let's find out what the hippo are doing there. Going underwater just as we go live. Typical, as you can see. There we go. There's another one. Very cool. Now, there's a group of hippos here, which we call a pod, as most of you know, but just in case there are some uh, new viewers, please open your mouth. Thank you very much, hippo. On command, just as you can see, is one of these new voice activated hippos that we've recently just got installed at Bivalzook Dam. It's quite nice. I was really excited to come and see them today um, as they've only been here for a couple of days now and um, it's quite nice. Yes, now pretend you're being a rock. Oh, look at that. <laughs> it's just amazing. <laughs> I'm hoping it's going to roll over next. Please roll over and show us your funny feet. No? Oh, there must be something wrong yet. I think you've got to start all slowly. It's something about uh, these new things. It takes time to get used to your voice. And then eventually you can ask them to do anything you want. But uh, there are a few more hippo in the Bubbles Hook Dam than I've seen before. They seem to be about five now. But you can't see them. You'll just have to trust me. There's two. There's three. Four. I'm pretty sure there was one more. I'm sure there were five here. Anyways, maybe the other one is shy and is holding its breath. As we know, hippos can do that very, very, very well. But it's a relaxing afternoon. Everybody's taking their time, just chilling out on a Sunday, getting ready to go out to the deck party. I don't know. Is it a thing? Sunday deck parties? I think we should make it a thing for the hippos. Sunday grazing parties where they go out and they eat themselves silly filled with grass although they're going to have to walk a little bit of a distance away <laughs> a little bit of uh, walking is going to have to be done the grazing in this particular area is not nice but um i don't know what it's like a buffalo's hook unfortunately but you can look around us it's quite sparse hmm? not that nice the impalas in that right-hand corner haven't come down to graze, that's for sure. Well, they are doing a bit of nibbling at the moment. I suspect they've come to the water's edge to drink, though. A little bachelor herd. And lots and lots of bachelor herds is what we're seeing at the moment. One big ram staring into the thicket. Is listening around. The wind has also just started to pick up quite a bit. Ooh, that's pretty scary. I think it's going to blow whatever is building up in the distance and I've seen clouds in the south. I think James is showing you them. Those big balls of candy floss. And then just above the impala is another huge embankment of clouds. And they are climbing vertically. Oops. Hmm. That might mean rain. I wonder what will happen if the clouds meet from the south and from the east. Anyways, if this wind keeps up though, it might blow whatever's brewing in the sky away. Now, for those of you that have never joined on one of these live and interactive safaris, you can actually ask me questions. Can you believe that? Or James, or Brent. All you have to do is hashtag a safari live. Uh, or you can also talk to us via the YouTube chat. That's also acceptable. Now, um, I suppose I better give you a very quick update. Since I'll be ready in case the hippos do something exciting, then I'll just duck. Should we do a practice run? A practice run. So if the hippos open their mouths, I'm about to tell you a story. This is what's going to happen. One, two, three. Wow, Senzo, that was so quick. But that's what we're going to do, though. <laughs> Only when a hippo opens its mouth, though. But for now, I'll quickly tell you a story. So we're driving up Cheetah Cut Line. We can kind of see where the torture pride have come in. Also saw some male leopard tracks. Very exciting. Um, they didn't look massive either, so I'm wondering if they aren't Hosanas. Maybe he, he popped into torture. I didn't quite see where they went off because we had all the torture tracks sort of mingle in with the leopard tracks, and then I just gave up because we know how many sub-adult lions are in the pride. And, well, to try and distinguish between about, what, 19 different lions and one leopard? Ah, oh, 
I was going to lose every single time. But there's also some Egyptian geese. But I know Rebecca wants to ask me a question as well. Hmm. Okay. Also, I was wrong. There was only four hippos. Um, so let's just quickly go back to hippos. Sorry, Senzo, just to coincide with Coast Sider's question about senses of hippos. Now, their most acute sense, I suppose, when they're in the water, what do you think it's going to be? I'm going to go with hearing. Because, well, their eyes, ears, and nose are all on the same plane when it's above the water. But we typically see their ears working quite hard. When they go underneath the water, I don't know what they'll be using. They don't really need much underneath the water. I suppose they can maybe open their eyes. I don't know how much they'll see in the murky water, however. But um, they're definitely not chasing after fish. So I don't think a hippo has any sensory organ or sensory nerves around its mouth to try and pick up vibrations of fish because it doesn't need to do that. Oh, you're sleeping and you got a bit of a fright. Did a tear and bite you where, where it was not supposed to? I bet that happens every now and then. Um, so I think when they get out of the water, I'm still going to go with their, their little, even though they've got little ears, I think their hearing's not too bad and their sense of smell, they've obviously got quite a large snout. Seems to be the largest feature on their bodies, well, on their face, in fact. Um, so I'm going to go with sense of smell as well. No one's having a good old snooze, eh? Great siesta. <laughs> Why do you keep getting a fright? Do you have hiccups? I don't know if it's maybe got hiccups the way that it was jerking its body like that. Um, Mina Moon, now you've noticed the beautiful sort of um, glistening shine that's on this hippo. You're wondering about why that is. Um, so what happens with hippos is that they secrete an oil called hipposuric acid. Uh, which is a substance also known as blood sweat. So I reckon that that's got something to do with it. It's quite an oily substance. So I can imagine when a little bit of water gets onto it and that they they do sort of boast that glossy sheen. Please roll for us. Somebody roll over. There's one coming closer, another one. I'm so convinced that there's only one big bull in this dam, though, and there he is. That's him. Now, they're all so sleepy. Well, he's on the move now. He, when we first got here, he was very upset with us. He opened his mouth, as he does normally. He's never very chuffed when anybody comes to view him and his ladies at at Buffalsook Dam. Now he's going under. He heard me say that. Um, so, Gizmo, I've seen a hippo dissected once. They've got a lot of fat on them. That they do. They've got a, quite a thick layer. But um, they do have muscle, of course, as well. So I'll try and dig out some pictures. I might, if I scroll through further enough down on my phone, back in time, I might be able to find some images of what the hippo sort of fatty substance looks like. It's it's quite insane how, how thick it actually is. It must have been about six or seven centimeters thick, maybe between five and seven centimeters thick. Of course, it depends on where you're looking on the body. Obviously, around the back and around the rump, there was plenty of it. But they have a very thin epidermis, though. Oh, wonderful. Well, James has been singing a couple of songs lately. But this time, he's not doing all the acting and singing. The grass is doing it for him. Well, I think that on a Sunday afternoon when there's not a great deal to find, what one should do is lie in a field of grass, observing the culms waving above one's head as the great blue vault of the African sky stretches infinitely up. I might pass out fairly soon, so I better stand up. I'm lying in a field of what is known as hypothelia dissoluta, or the yellow thatching grass. Hello. As you can see, some of it is even taller than I. And while I'm not very large, I am five feet and eight inches, and this grass is roughly equivalent at five feet and eight inches, and you can see how effective it must be as a thatching grass. So that is hypothelia dissoluta, the yellow thatching grass. And I'll pick your piece if you'd like. Would you like me to? 
You would? Okay, good. Here we go. It always reminds me of uh, the sort of late winter time in August in the Natal part of the Drakensberg Mountains where you get this red thatching grass growing and oh it's just the most wonderful colour. So there it is. Quite an impressive uh, organism really. Nothing more I can tell you about it. Very bad grazing grass. Hopeless in fact. And if you were ever wanting to make straw, that's what you'd make it of. So if you were the second little pig, you'd quite like Hypothelia dissoluta as well, uh, because you would make... No, the first little pig, sorry. The first little pig made his house of straw, Fergus, not the second one. He made his prefab the second one, didn't he? Yeah, yes. I'm not sure. I'm big ah, right. Uh, some are worried about ticks lying in that grass. Well, yes, there may be a few. I'll check my leggies when I get home and stop any that are crawling up towards the sensitive parts because that's what they do, of course. Very unpleasant. Now, let's find a mammal, shall we? A real, actual mammal. That would be wonderful. Or a bird. I'll take a bird. An unusual bird, like a yellow bellied eromomala. I must say, no, no, not I must say. I want to ask you all, why don't you, you send through, while we wait for something massively action oriented to happen, why don't you send through a bird that you would like to see, an unusual bird that you would like to see, that you know occurs here. There are some arrow marked babblers in this grove of silver cluster leaf trees. You see them there, Ferg. They are still around. So send us through on a hashtag for live or on the chat on YouTube. Tell us what unusual bird you might like to see this afternoon. Gone. Around. They do like to pop. There's one in the that tree there. There we go, it's just gone to the left. This is the fascinating babbler sighting. Ah, there's its bottom. Wonderful. It's a flock of about ten of them. Trish, you'd like to see an ostrich, that's a good call. Brent may be able to find one at Chitwa Chitwa and challenge him with ostrich. I think I've seen one there. I think I've seen one on the airstrip actually. Ali, a Cory Bustard, another good one. Many in the Mara, of course, and some here, but not very common. What else? I would like to see a yellow bellied Eromomala. They are gorgeous. They have yellow bellies. That's why they're called yellow bellied, Fergus. Yes, the yellow-bellied thermometer. Come on, there must be something else around here. Ah, Kathy, you want to see an African hoopoe? Of all the requests we've had, Kathy, yours is most likely the one to be uh, fulfilled. You like that one, do you, Fergus? Easy to film. And just very nice, yes, the African hoopoe. Ah, here we have some people on their game drive. Some African people, yes. Good afternoon. How are you doing? Good. Absolutely nothing. There was a flock of arrow marked babblers, though. I've seen a few of Ten of them. <laughs> Good luck. Yeah. Oh, they've seen our arrow marked babblers already. They don't want to see any more. Yes, doing my best to impress the people. I suppose I should have asked what they saw around here. All right, well, good news is Brent Leo Smith has managed to find himself some footprints. Let's see if he can find what's on the end of them. Well, there we go. A big male leopard track. I think it is quarantine coming into Chitwa Chitwa. 
So it's sometime during the day today. Quarantine is marched in. So I think it's quarantine. Tracks look a bit bigger than uh, Tingana's tracks. So hopefully it is. I'll be very, very happy to see. Litter uh, before Hasana and Shongile. So he is, his brother is Kunyuma, but in, is off, uh, he's on Mala Mala now where they call him the Senegal Bush male. And he set up territory to the south here. Yeah? So, and quarantine kicked out yeah. uh, his, uh, his older half brother, who is by the name of Shivambalan and pushed him out of this area to the east of us, Cheetah Plains and the southern sections of Torchwood. Oh, hello. Is that, is that a female track as well? Let's have a quick look at. No. Snot. Is it? Is Kachava around as well? No, it's not, it's not, it's not. But these tracks are quite nice. You can see them just carrying on here. I'm just going to keep checking where they're going. Fingers crossed we get to find quarantine. Now, the main, the main reason I actually came out into this area was to try to get our mammal list up with Stenborg and Diker. But I'll take leopard tracks, I will. Uh, Justin... Sorry, let me just fiddle with this button here. Justin, he's called Quarantine because of the area he frequented when he first became independent from his mother. So there's that clearing outside of uh, our camp called Quarantine. And it's called Quarantine as that's because where they used to quarantine cattle uh, when were, people were still trying to cattle farm in this area. So they would quarantine so he, he spent a lot of time on the quarantine clearings uh, when he became independent from Karula. It's going very slowly. And he seems his tracks are still here. Now, with him around, you must check every big termite mound. Okay, so Karula was a very successful female leopard for many years and she produced quite a lot of offspring. Child of the universe, the, the offspring of hers that are still alive, I've lost the tracks. Let me just have a quick, sorry, squiz here. Um, interesting. No tracks here, so I think we're going to have to check Shabalala Road. Uh, so it is Quarantine's alive, Kunyuma's alive, um... We don't know about Shivambalan anymore. Tandi, most obviously. Tandi from her first litter. Uh, I'm just trying to think. I think that's it at the moment. Um, that we can be 100% certain on, of. Now, of course, a lot of the, the males, young males over the years, might have dispersed further and could still be very much alive. Just we don't know. They could be in remote parts of Kruger where people don't go. But so yes, uh, that's the three we know, Tandi, Quarantine and Kunyuma, and Asana of course, silly me, four. Uh, up until recently, of course, uh, Shadow was also part of that group, but she's obviously uh, hasn't been seen in so many months, or over, over about two months now. So it's probably safe to assume that she is uh, moved on to the next plane. And we just got Iena tracks here, no leopard tracks. Uh, now we look for various different things, Evelyn, when, we, when we're trying to locate a leopard. 
Uh, footprints are a good idea to give you a good general direction where to go, uh, but most of the time you find them from the alarm calls of other animals. So uh, squirrels, impala, kudu all make a lot of noise when uh, they spot a predator like a leopard. So they all shout to the tops of the trees, trying to tell everyone to be careful that there's a predator around. Okay, there's no sign of them going that way. So what we're going to do is we're going to loop back through onto Shabalala Road. Shabalala means kudu in Zulu, for those who are wondering. And Shangan, it is Nongo. Now, as I say, quarantine's been pushing slowly, slowly, further and further. Uh, into Chitwa. Now this is probably a better territory than the one he's got. That's why he wants to take it from Tingana. But it's going to be very interesting to see how the leopard dynamics play out in the next little while. Now it seems like you set James a bird challenge, so let's see how he's going with that. No, no ostriches, no African hoopoos, no Cory Bustards. It's getting quite windy, which I think is making finding ostriches very difficult. They like to, you know, go into their burrows when it's windy like this. I agree with Brent that the leopard dynamics going on here at the moment are fascinating. I mean, they've played out here for millennia. But it's not often that you get to actually watch a takeover and a change like the one we've been able to now. There's a tiny little flock of birds on the top of that tree there for Augusto. Well, there's one bird. It's calling. Yeah. Top, you got him there. There we are. Don't fly, please. Oh. Two of them. They were yellow-fronted canaries. Beautiful little yellow canaries, really. And apparently Rebecca wanted to see the yellow-fronted canary. Well, we aim to please. It's like a good climbing tree, that one. <coughs> Leopard tree. Yes. Mm. Also, I would like to know what has happened to Shadow. There's been apparently no word from or of her for some time now. And one doesn't want to fear the worst, but it would seem that things might have, uh, well, not been particularly pleasant for her. Skeeter, you were wondering what happened to Shadow. I don't know. And there haven't been any reports of her from all for a while. Shadulu obviously pushing down into her territory. Shadow, for those of you who don't know, now I guess she must be ten by now. Ten-year-old female leopard, Tundi's litter mate. So, a bit odd that we haven't seen her. No, eleven. They're eleven now. And she used to hang around here. So who knows what's happened to her and not Barbara. Not Barbara was her cub, or is her cub, depending on where they are on this earth or in another realm. Bob, a nice one from you about the life expectancy of a leopard. Well, it really does depend on a lot of luck. Potentially leopards like uh, Tingana could live up to sort of 14 years old. That would be very old for a male. I think the oldest male on record in the Sabi Sand was the Campan male who made it to 15. Uh, and that's very old. So, I mean, you know, 12, 13, 14, that would be around about the age for a male leopard uh, if he manages to stay out of trouble. But of course, that will reduce as soon as pressure is brought to bear and no one can predict what sort of pressure will be brought to bear on these animals and certainly Tingana who's I just I don't think he's quite hit his 12th birthday yet uh, he I'm surprised that he has lost as much condition as quickly as he has and I really think that he is ill I don't think he's well 
I remember that one day we found him lying underneath a bush and he just didn't move. And this was before we'd seen Hukumuri and he just didn't move. For two days he lay under that bush and then he sauntered into Chitra camp and lay there for another few days. He's put on weight since that time but he seems to be doing a lot of sleeping and I wonder if he's just not well and if that hasn't allowed Hukumuri to come into this area unchallenged. And now for Tingana to take it back again, very difficult. Female leopards live a little bit longer than the males, potentially up to 17 or 18 years, and in captivity probably a bit longer, but I would say an average of 14 or 15. And our beloved Karula or I obviously only made it to just over 13. Debbie, did it? You say Karula's male cubs haven't dispersed very far. Is that unusual? Well, it's only unusual if there is, you know, if, if they're occupying territories that were full. Uh, obviously, quarantine moved on to, Chit on to Cheetah Plains into an area where his father used to be sort of dominant and his father then disappeared so that kind of gave him his spot uh, and he wedged himself between his brother Shivambalana and in and Tingana and I think Shivambalana has just gone further and further east into the Kruger and so quarantines found himself a small there's a green pigeon that is now flying at a great speed away from us it was eating these fruits Quarantine just found himself a sort of, uh, not a very large territory, but a territory there between Cheetah Plains and Chitwa Chitwa. Moving on to Chitwa now. So I don't think necessarily that her other male offspring, I mean Gunyuma went all the way down to Mala Mala, that's quite far. Uh, Shivambalan has gone into the Kruger. I don't know where, I don't even remember if Misho and Induna were both males, I'm not sure. Uh, but they certainly aren't seen around here anymore. So no, I don't think they they are dispersing unusually close to their natal territories. There is the vulture whose home is in this tree. Let's have a look at him. Oh, no, we've got behind a tree, which means he'll probably fly as soon as we get any closer. Please don't fly. Please stay where you are. There's nothing else to see except you. There we are. Wonderful. Now what you'll see of course is the vulture up there in the tree and below his nest a mistletoe. And in vulture society of course uh, the romance of mistletoe happens beneath your nest, not above your door. Did you know that Fergus? Yes, exactly. You don't want to go to a vulture party unaware of that. You might, ha you might have to, you might find yourself having to kiss a lappet-faced vulture. It would be very unpleasant. Russen, you wanted to see a vulture. Well, that is a white-faced vulture, and that is its home. That's the mistletoe I've been talking about. That green spot there, and then the platform of sticks just above, is the nest. And they obviously nest in trees. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, I'm just going to check this up for you. I think their egg laying time is now. Let me just look that up for you. One of the few birds that will breed during the winter months. V for vulture. W for white backed. There it is. Let's go to eggies. Breeding. Breeding monogamous, presumed to be pair for life. Singly, blah blah. Mm hmm. Yes, 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 yes. Nest, one adult, presumably male, brings most sticks. Oh, that's interesting. Mate places and arranges them. So the ma <laughs> the male goes out and fetches the sticks and he brings them back, and the female then puts them together into the nest. That seems like a very amicable way to do things rather than arguing over the general feng shui she's in charge of that and he goes and he fetches what she needs lined with dry grass sometimes green leaves yes 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 blah blah so they lay their eggies between april and july 
that's in Zimbabwe. In South Africa, April to June. That's very interesting. Ah. So, I believe that Taylor has seen both of this pair uh, arranging the sticks, so they obviously have a slightly more equitable relationship, a more modern vulture family. He's got an itchy head, poor fellow. Anyway, and the incubation period, just 56 days. And they, I just want to find out when they fledge then. They fledge at about 90 days, can't be. Nestling period, yeah, I don't know, 108 to 140 days, depending on the conditions, I guess. That's quite a big range. So 120 days is how many months, Fergus? Four months. Four to five months in the nest. And then they fly away and must go and find disgusting pieces of rotting flesh to eat all on their own. I imagine being a vulture chick is fairly unpleasant from a meal point of view because, well, not only do your parents eat foul and rotting material, they then bring it up for you to eat when they return home. I think that's, that's very unpleasant. Low, yes, start with the bar low, I guess. If you're going to go and eat a rancid carcass, uh, best it tastes better than what you used to get at home. So we shall watch this nest with eagerness, and I'm glad Taylor said that she was saw them actually interacting at the nest. It means that we may well have some little vultures in this area sometime fairly soon. Well, that was a nice animal sighting, wasn't it, Fergus? Mm. Yes, very good. Oh, we have a question. Let's stay here. Child of the universe, you say, why are none of the leopard carcasses found? Um, I, I, I'm not sure what you mean. They, they are. It's not like leopard carcasses are never found. We, well, we find them. Vultures and hyenas absolutely find them. And so if they are out in the open, then, oh, oh, I see. Right, so you mean the, the, the carcasses of dead leopards as opposed to the carcasses as leopards have killed. All right. Um, I suspect quite often because they go off to die in very thick bush. And it is very common, in fact, that you don't find leopard carcasses, no matter how well you know the leopard. And I think what they do is, you know, if they're injured or something like that, they'll go and find such thick bush where they'll choose to sort of either convalesce or die quietly that, yeah, you wouldn't find the carcasses. Be unusual to find them. And then, of course, you know, in not very long, hyenas, I mean, hyenas will definitely discover the carcasses once they start to rot, and they'll tear them to pieces very quickly. And so, you know, you may find some of the bones that we found are lion and leopard carcasses. But it's largely because they go to quiet places to pop off. Pop their clogs, as it were. All right, Fergus, shall we press on? From our Vulsh. We'll go off towards Treehouse Dam and see what we can find there. I know Taylor started there, but you never know what's come down by now. Bye, Vulsh. Have a lovely day, afternoon. He's just watching the sun go down quietly, or she is. Maybe they've had a fight. He's been banished. All right, Taylor McCurdy has now given up trying to find signal on Jigger. Uh, she's on her feet and on quarantine clearings, and she'd like to f tell you about what that experience feels like on a Sunday. Bushwalk 
2.0 for the day. Thank goodness I didn't do a workout. Because now we're going to do this bushwalk like this, backwards. We're going to... I think we might actually have... Come on, Senzo. Come on, up the pace. I'm doing... Come on, I'm doing the... Um, what do you guys have to do all the time? You have to run in front of me. What's so hard? <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> Today, on afternoon bushwalk for a little bit, maybe we will do workouts. We will find things in the bush that we can work out with. Whether it's picking up rocks, pushing down trees. No, I'm joking. We're not going to be doing any of that. I have absolutely no idea what I'm going to show you on this bushwalk as I've literally just stepped out of final control. Um, so we will try and find something. I don't think we're going to have a huge amount of insects, I'm afraid, as it hasn't been the nicest day. And if I were an insect, I probably just would have called it quits and stayed home under cover, under a leaf. So maybe we'll have to be turning over many leaves today. Let's check this Wealtheria. Wealtheria, Wealtheria, please give us something, even a thrip. Not even one. Okay, next tree. Oh, let's go to Brent quickly with monkeys. Well, there we go. Number seven on the species list, vervet monkeys. Looking a little bit out of sorts in the long grass. Oh, there's a latecomer. Let me just go back a little bit for VM. <laughs> well, off it goes. Doesn't want to be left behind. Chop, 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 chop. Now, of course, they're really important uh, for us monkeys. Uh, apart from being wonderful to watch, they're also really, really uh, great spotters of leopards. Oh, that one fell out of the branch. Let me just go f forward a little bit for VM so we can try to get a better view of them. A whole bunch of them there. So, uh, there we go. So, vervet monkeys have incredibly good eyesight. And, uh, oh, look at them playing. And like a lot of primates, they can be very, very playful, particularly at this time of the day. They're almost done with their foraging and feeding, and they're, they're going to be looking for a good spot to roost. So, they can be lovely and playful at this time of the day. It looks like one of the big males there, keeping a watchful eye on everything. Anyway, you see he's right up to the top, making sure there's no potential danger for his troop. Uh, yeah, I'm happy for you, Saskia. This is Saskia's first monkey sighting. Well, that's wonderful. That's quite a nice one. Oh, and down. So I think they're heading down towards the river. Um... Or the little, the Mulwainini, so they can hide uh, and get right up in the trees and that's where they're going to roost for the evening normally. Now we're going to just quickly shoot down the airstrip. Lots of impala and stuff around here, maybe we'll get another species. Uh, I'm just waving quickly and hopefully try and get another species so we're on seven which is not bad vm said we'd only get nine species today i still think we can get to at least 11 different species uh, on our drive today and i think chitwa is the place to do it on chitwa chitwa i think we might get a surprise or three of the different species so let's hope we get some bush buck as well We've already seen these two species already, but it is just lovely golden light on them, uh, the Impala and Inyala. Now, what we want them to do is start barking, so our eighth species of the day can be a leopard. But at the moment, they're all looking very relaxed. And we're going to send you back to Madame McCurdy on foot, who's got something that likes to curl up to defend itself. Almost, not yet though. It was scared a minute ago, but we have got Mildred, aka a millipede, for those of you who have no idea. I can't remember why we called it a Mildred. I think I may have collected one and then drove it around for the whole safari and decided to give it a name. And I'm big on alliteration. So Mildred, millipede, 
well, you get the picture. Now, these are very cool little creatures, although to you, to some of you, you may think, oh, no, Taylor, get away from that puffy. But they're really quite cool. They're fun to put in your hands to let them walk around. But they're also really important to the environment um, because just like termites are largely responsible for decomposing uh, vegetable matter, so are mildreds. They do a very, very good job. And because they eat such large quantities of uh, decaying plant matter, um, you can imagine it's got to go somewhere. And we know that when they do defecate, and it's quite cool because it is their defense as well. But what I'm getting to is we'll get to the defense in a minute, but most of you know about it, is just like I always talk about the caterpillars and how them eating leaves recycles nutrients back into the soil a lot quicker with their feces, with their fresh frass. The same thing applies to the millipedes, which is very, very cool. So we must be thankful for them. Although I can imagine when there are lots of them, when you see them in large groups, they'll probably be a little bit of a pest. Now, this one is searching, 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 maybe for a burrow. I don't know if I'd like to be out late at night. They typically are a diurnal. Maybe you get some nocturnals. <laughs> so maybe you get some nocturnal ones. I'm unfamiliar with any nocturnal ones. I would imagine that they'd prefer to be out on a nice warm day. So maybe it's going to curl up, or go into a hole into the ground somewhere. Um, or it's just searching for a patch of decaying leaves that it will feast before it Sorry about that, everybody. We find ourselves once more clashing to us. Us, yes. We had some hornbills, but they were very nasty and they flew away. Ooh, here it's... Wait, wait, everyone. We've got some real action going on here. <gasps> Fergus, do you see? It is the... It is the canary nettle. Isn't that pretty? And we shall remind ourselves, Fergus, of the Latin name of the canary nettle. Do you know what it is? I'm going to say you don't. Would I be correct? You don't look very Latin, no. No, in fact, Latin you're inescapably not. It's a rather wonderful name, and it goes as follows, if I can find it, because I can't remember it, naturally. It is um, Sphedamnocarpus pruriens. Sphidamnocarpus pruriens. Would you like to try and say that? But try anyway. It's a good one. Sphidamnocarpus pruriens. There we are. You see, you are Latin. You basically come from Venezuela, like Ali. You are Ali's Venezuelan brother, Diego. <laughs> Sphedamnocarpus pruriens. Thank you, Diego. Let us continue to treehouse them. <laughs> Sphedamnocarpus pruriens. <laughs> there it is, everyone. You can all practice saying that wherever you happen to find yourselves in the world today. There's lots of Spadamnocarpus purians all over the place. I remember the day, it was a day much like this one, where there wasn't a great deal going on on the reserve, and somehow we got into long words. And somebody sent me the following word, Hippopotomonstrosesquipedalophobia, which I believe, if I remember correctly, is the fear of long words. Hippopotomonstro sesquipedalophobia. Yes, good word that. 
I'm having a bout of hippopotomonstrosesquipedalophobia. And Rebecca says, do I know how to spell it? Well, my spelling is so utterly appalling, I'm just going to immediately say no. Yes. It's a little common wax bill. I have found you a tiny bird to look at. That's a... No, it's not. It's a Melba finch, a.k.a. green-winged pytilia. And that's Mrs. Green-winged pytilia. We don't often get a picture of a female green-winged pytilia like this. The male is... Oh, there's... Oh, no. And there's some five inches. Brent was looking for five inches earlier. Just below... Oh, gorgeous shot of what looks like a blue-billed fire finch. Rebecca is of the opinion that that bird looks like it should be in Switzerland with Heidi. I have absolutely no idea why the poor blue-billed fire finch should live with Heidi in the freezing climes of the Swiss Alps. But each... Pops are part of, uh, that's uh, Holland, isn't it? Clogs. Clock, clock, clock. Oh, clock, part of a clock, yes, perhaps. Did Heidi have a clock a cuckoo like cuckoo that? Cuckoo. Did Heidi have a cuckoo clock? Yeah, no, but it's a cuckoo, not a fire finch. Yes. It's not a fire finch clock. clock, exactly. Anyway, those are two very nice little birds that we saw there. Let's continue. Highlight of the day. All right, Taylor has decided that she is a little bit short today, and so she has managed to gather herself a few feet. Really short, I can't. I'm going to fall over. I tried very hard to gather myself, but I was also too quiet for not so long. Look at what's happened to me. I just want to show you, if anybody that does not suffer from grass allergies, this is literally my life. Look at that. Look at those welts. Isn't that amazing? They're so cool and they're so itchy. I cannot tell you how itchy that is. I just I just want to scratch it and Senzel was telling me off as I was trying to stand on the tree. He told me there's no need to scratch it. He even did one of these to tell me off. Now let's try and find a natural antihistamine. I remember Herbie saying something once about the cambium layer of a marula tree. However, I don't have my multi-tool with me this afternoon to try and cut away. Do you have your le Leatherman with you, Senzel? Not today. Okay, next time. Sorry, we were not prepared for bush. <laughs> we just sort of ran out. Senzel had slip slops on. He had to go and put shoes on. Show everybody your nice shoes, please, Senzel. Look how lovely they are. Oh, look at the outfit. So he's got gaiters on, not horse riding gaiters. Let's not get confused. Those ones are to stop the grass seeds from growing in your shoes, which I forgot at home, and my mother shouted at me. She, did, she reprimanded me. She told me that I've left everything, my binocular straps, all sorts of things. But what was behind bark, piece of bark? Let's pull a bit off. Ooh, I can put that back on. But look what I found. I will be able to stick it. We have found behind park number one some worms, some larvae of sorts. One has already pupated. You can see the one on the left. And these two which I didn't mean to do this to because I didn't think there would be anything here, uh, have not pupated just yet. I don't know what larvae it would be. Maybe a boring beetle larvae. Perhaps some of you have known, maybe they've been identified before. This is on a marula tree. But let me close them. Let me put their cupboard back on. Now I've got to play the game of shapes. Which way does it go? Like that. The beauty of a marula tree. Healed. Fixed. I would beat Kirsten at doing puzzles, but she's also not very good at doing puzzles. Just joking. She's much better than me. She has more patience than me to do puzzles. Um, now, Senzo is basically going to be deciding not what we're talking about today, but what trees and things we'd be going to. So earlier on, before we had Mildred, before we were rudely interrupted by the technical gremlins again, we're going to have a look at this tree. And there could be many different things that live here. Scorpions, lizards termites. Actually, I can see some termite activity over here, in fact, but we will wait.
because there's no need to rush away. I'm going to send you to James, who apparently has got a very nice view of the sunset. Well, we do have a view of the sun. The sun is setting and the wind is starting to blow. Perhaps a storm coming up. Oh, Fergus, you very nicely managed to frame the sun in the gap between the trees. Well done. It was my parking, though, wasn't it? Yes. It's all up to me. Yes. Very nice picture it is. Hmm. I think we'll wait to, for it to go out of that gap. And the gull just clouds above it. Hello, Monty. You say that the bird was the 70th bird on your list. I'm assuming you're talking about the... Uh, the firefinch, Heidi's bird. That's great. I'm assuming you have the blacksmith lapwing on your list. We have a blacksmith lapwing here watching the sun go down, having a bath. Which I think Taylor said was not here when she came down last time, so I told you it'd be a good idea. It'd be a great plethora of things coming down during the afternoon, one of which is the blacksmith lapwing. Not very rare. Fairly common. Oft seen. Hello. Have you had a good Sunday? You have? Have a roast chicken dinner, did you? Hmm? Roast lamb today. Hmm? Delicious. Yum. Yes. Quite interesting to see him pull a roast chicken out of the oven, really. We even have an oven. Mm. There are the others calling. I think those are chicks, you know that. Look at those four that have just landed. I suspect that those little, those little, they're adults now, but I suspect that they've just fledged and they're from the season because they're quite territorial birds. And so they're unlikely to stay in an area with other blacksmith lapwings unless they are very closely related to the territorial blacksmith lapwings of the area in question. They're looking for ants, most likely, of which there will be many. This is really quite cool, actually. Caitlin, you ask a question that is seemingly obvious, but has no obvious answer, I don't think. Well, I guess it does have a relatively obvious answer. You say, why are some birds so common and some birds so rare? I think some birds are just better adapted to living at this particular stage of the Earth's life. So a good example would be the blacksmith lapwing. There's lots of habitat for it to live in, lots of different things for it to eat, and it's adapted to eating what's available now. And then you take something like a ground hornbill, for example, which, by very nature of its diet, it's a predator, it's always, almost always going to be less common than something that is more herbivorous. It doesn't have many nesting sites like uh, it, it used to. They're enormous birds, which means they need enormous nesting sites. They take nine years to get to breeding sort of adulthood. So I think there are a whole number of reasons, but I, I would say it's largely to do with habitat. And I think if you were to go back, I don't know, say 3,000 years and then 4,000 years, and then, you know, if you were to go back a thousand years at a time, you'd probably find that some of the birds that are very common now were rarer, and some of the birds that are rare now were much more common. So it's not surprising that something like a, a Narina trogon is not as common as a blacksmith lapwing because its habitat is that much more fragmented and far uh, less common. Oh, another war playing out on the plains is taking place on quarantine clearings with Taylor. 
and I promise it's not between Senzo and I yet. Oh my goodness, there was also a spider. Senzo, did you see that? Termites versus ants, and then look at that thing there. I'm gonna, you know what? I'm gonna illegally chase it. Run! Ah! It jumped. Sorry, I don't know if you can see it. There. Can you see that thing there, Senzo? Sorry, I'm, I'm messing up your. Your juju there as you kneel down. But there's something really small and white, and I don't know what kind of spider it is. I can't really tell if it's a jumping spider or not, but it's exceptionally small. Was it going for the ants, or was it going for the termite? If I was a spider, I'd probably go for a delicious termite. I don't think that ants taste quite as nice. And as you can clearly see, the proof is in the pudding this afternoon. As the ants have raided the termite nest, they're still going after them. They're taking them back one by one, decimating the colony's population of termites. <laughs> but they haven't got too far to walk. And it's actually not uncommon to see ants and termites sort of living in close proximity uh, to one another. Obviously, these little termites are feeding on wood at the moment and probably grasses and other uh, vegetable matter. However, these ants are ravenous and they have a craving for termites that only termites can, well sort that craving out I suppose is where I was going to go with that but uh, they're taking lots of them so I'm trying to think how these ants would be killing these termites because you can see this is where they're starting look here maybe we're going to see them putting up a fight where are the soldiers where's the reinforcement come on termites there's a little hole in there and I think that's where the ants are going in and then there's actually a couple if you look over there some termites and ants. Oh no, I did that, sorry. And I think those workers are trying to fight back. So I think those ants might be biting them. Perhaps they have a venom of sorts. I don't think though. I don't, I don't know about ants being venomous. Maybe they just bite them to the point that they can't survive anymore. It's very brutal, very savage, as you can see. Barbaric, if you will. As they grab them. Some of them are carrying their own termite. And I mean, those termites are tiny, tiny, tiny little ones, and those ants are probably about a third of the size of the termite. But that's incredible. It looks like those termites are trying to fight back, facing their opponents with their pincers. I don't imagine they're very strong. They need the soldiers. I don't know why the soldiers haven't come through yet to help out. That's very unusual. Normally when there is an attack on a colony of whether it's ants or termites, the soldiers will come on in and try and protect them. And then those little ants will not stand a chance. Build a wall! Build a wall! Do you think that's what they're all shouting? It's like a Game of Thrones scene going on over here this afternoon. Anyways, it, I don't know. I'm, actually, I'm going to come and crouch next to Senzo because he's got such an amazing view. Much better than what I can see. Try and figure out what's actually going on. There's one termite sacrificing itself. It's putting up a fight, though. It's not letting them, well, yes, it's not going out easy. Look at them all swarming in. I've been told to move the grass. Yeah, gone. Is that better? That was for effect. Oh, my goodness, look how they have this termite. They're pulling it from either side, but they need to take it home to feed the rest of the ant colony. Go, go, go. I don't even know if that termite is still alive. They're pulling at its legs. It doesn't stand a chance, I'm afraid. Dynamite definitely comes in small packages. Oh, my goodness. Shame. I'm so sorry, little termite, and I'm just standing here watching you. <sighs> Senzo, we could be next. We better be very careful that we don't get carried away into a chamber, never to see the light of day again. Anyways, okay, sorry termites, good luck. I don't think the ants are really going to decimate your whole colony. <laughs> We're obviously being dramatic because it's Sunday, and I think that on Sundays you're allowed to be a little bit on the dramatic side, but that was quite a nice little wall, don't you think, going on between uh, two species. So, we didn't find a lizard, we didn't find a scorpion, but there's a big hole going into the side of the log, and looks like more of a termite mound. I don't actually want to know what's living in there. So we're going to move away from that now because that looks very um, mumba-like. Brent, however, has arrived at Chitwa Dam for the second time today. I wonder if he's going to add new mammals to his list.
Come on, Taylor, put your hand in the hole. Put your hand in the hole. No, that's not never a good idea unless you have a torch. Uh, yeah, so we, we've struggling to find some new mammals on Chitra and no fresh sign of leopard anywhere apart from those tracks that uh, when they got to the main road were obliterated but I think he's gone north into Torchwood so I think we're going to head back towards Juma now uh, head along Cheetah Cutline maybe Tundi has come back from Torchwood uh, you never know it's the right time of the day Now, uh, there's lots of different ways to describe uh, predator tracks, Dina. Uh, like you could, uh, I think the most correct, actual correct way is probably uh, of the cats as pug marks. So rather than footprints or, or I suppose, but tracks, lion track, leopard track, it's, it's all pretty much correct. You call it lion footprints, it's still correct. Uh, but I think sort of the, the uh, one of the terms is is pug marks for, for, for the cats, the big cats. Never really thought about it too much, to be honest, Dina. Now, in a lot of a lot of areas in, in Africa, sometimes you will find animals that have, have, have collars. Kristen, uh, we don't collar in this area to, to, to track their territories. Uh, we do it, uh, the leopards here are mostly habituated and we can find them with relative ease uh, and work out their territories quite easily from just where we see them. There's no need to collar them. Uh, there are different research organizations that do collar from time to time, but not in the Sabi Science. If we see a collared animal here, uh, it is normally being collared outside of the Sabi Sands and has come in. So occasionally we'll see uh, collared wild dogs. It's probably the most col common collared animal we see as they are an endangered species. And uh, the EWT, Endangered Wildlife Trust, is monitoring the majority of uh, the packs in this area. And some of those packs will, will indeed have collars. And uh, the other two animals that we see that are collared from time to time is elephant. And, uh, and buffalo. And both those situations, again, they've been collared uh, under various different research projects, but inside the Kruger National Park. And then, of course, us being open to the Kruger, they will wander in and out uh, of, of, of the Sabi Sands into the Kruger and so on. Okay, maybe we're gonna have some Tundi luck because she has been giving me a hard time over the last couple of weeks. So yesterday she was deep inside Torchwood, so there's a very good chance she might have meandered her way back, depending on where she left Kalamba. Hmm, lots of big clouds all around us. There we go, look at that. Lots of big, big, beautiful clouds. And let's hope the rain stays away till the end of the sunset safari. So on our mammal challenge, we're on seven. VM, you might be right. VM said nine. I'm hoping we can get over nine. And uh, let me just change a uh, tact here. And I'm just going to come off the eastern channel that I was using on Chitra and back on the northern channel uh, to use on Juma. Now, Waterbuck is one of the one animals we've already got on our mammal challenge, so let's go to James while I try to find something else. Uh, there are some Waterbuck, and unfortunately I cannot move into a position where you can see anything other than their backsides because we will lose signal entirely. I do apologize for that. Oh, there we go. Thank you very much. Beautiful waterbuck bull, young bull. Um, I wanted to say something of vital importance. Oh, yes. So, Brent's seen seven mammals. What have we seen? We've seen, I can't believe there's anything close to that. We've seen warthogsies, these chaps. We've had an impala. There's three. 
three species in two and a half hours, no, two hours. So this will be a young, her, a young, uh, this will be a herd of young bulls, still quite friendly with each other, enjoying the sort of the fraternal bond of bachelors. And then in not too long from now, they will become older and disgusted by each other's presence and seek out the presence of ladies. And I'm sure they're hanging around here because there isn't a territorial bull around Twin Dams where we find ourselves. At the dam, where there is not much going on, there is one lonely gypto goose. Its partner's uh, absconded, forsaken it. No, no, there it is. They have two partners. Oh, hang on. Oh, no, that's a vehicle. I thought it was an elephant. Okay, let's go. As the <laughs> that elephant is moving very quickly. Let's go across to the gypto geese. Oh, what happened? Are you right there, Fergus? Beautiful clouds. They're very nice if they overlaid a leopard or a lion. Or an elephant, a buffalo. <clears throat> Very pretty indeed. Now, do you, Anne, I believe you want to see... Who? Tula, Tula Anne wants to see a duck. Well, it's your, your luck. Here is a duck. Called a goose, but in fact a duck. You can see it is a grazing duck. It is grazing on grass. There we are. The Egyptian goose or tomb duck. Very nice. And a landscape of fairly sort of nutrient poor soil. And when you look at soil like this, an exposed low felt soil, you can see why this place was such a disaster for any form of agriculture. There really is very little nutrition in the soil, and apparently the low felt itself is some of the most ancient land in Africa. And what that means is that it has, for the longest time, more, more than any other area in Africa, not had any tectonic or volcanic activity. And that means that it has had no fresh deposits of nutrients for much longer than many other landscapes in Africa. And that's why it's hopeless for agriculture in most parts. Beautiful. Right, Taylor McCurdy finds herself in the great herds of quarantine. Let's go and see. Oh, yes, it's very exciting up here today. We've got wildebeest as far as the eye can see, dotted with imp impala in between. Very nice, don't you think? I'm going to creep over to Senzel so I can see what you're looking at, because I think it might be different to me. Ah, yes, standing in and amongst the marula trees. No. Tucker, who is only five years old. Hello, my dear friend. It's great to have a question from you. Now, your question specifically was about the zebra and where are they? Do we not have them anymore? Have they all died? <sighs> Tucker, I'm afraid they have not all died. No, why would I say something like that? I should have been like, no, Tucker, they haven't died. I promise you they're still all right. They're on holiday at the moment. Um, they're not um, willing to, to stay out here and get rained on. They don't like the rain, so they've been trying to avoid it. So they've gone north for a little bit. I would imagine they've gone north that way. You can't see it, though, but it's down in that direction. And uh, the grass is nice and tall. It's 
great. You know, they're maybe having a family reunion. Perhaps they haven't seen their other zebra friends or cousins or brothers or sisters for a very, very, very long time. So maybe everyone was busy and was doing, you know, private holidays over Christmas. And normally April is a good time of the year to have a Christmas holiday. Anyways, <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about. Sorry, Tucker. They will be back, I promise you. And the day that we see a, a zebra... I'm going to make sure that you are watching so that we can show you all the zebras. But there is an impala ram chasing the girls around, causing all sorts of havoc. Stop stirring. You can see. Look at the pandemonium that's going on now. They're all just like, oh, we're just trying to get ready for bed. And now we've gone out for a sprint. I always feel sorry for the impala ewes at this time of the year. They don't stop. It's just go, go, go. All the time. The wildebeest not really acknowledging what's going on. They're just standing still, hoping that an impala won't run into them. But as those females look very relaxed, there's one member of the wildebeest herd that is not relaxed at all. And that is the bull, who is keeping a very close eye on us. Also, you may see some lights and a fence. That's uh, our other accommodation, staff accommodation. Hello, boy. So that's the big bull. He's been standing guard. He's been watching us and snorting at us all afternoon. And I wouldn't want to get too close to his herd because he's just got his lady, so you can imagine he'd be quite protective over them. So we'll probably just stand from way over here and watch him. Some impala ewes trying to escape from that ram that was chasing them around. Yes, Rebecca, I would imagine that the wildebeest do get annoyed with the impala, especially when they have to listen to that snortling noise that the impala make, and then racing laps. Just did a massive high kick jump. Not that one, but there was another one that sprinted and did a huge leap. Okay, so what we're going to wait for now is unfortunately these animals are all kind of like sheep in the sense that they're herd animals and they follow one another. See? Yes. Now they're all starting to run in that direction slowly, building up speed. There's one racing on in. There it comes. You'll see it's about to overtake. There it goes. Bounce, bounce, bounce. They're all going to follow now, so this is going to be quite exciting. No, I would give that Impala only a 4 out of 10 disappointment you get kicked off the south african team here we go who have we got next no one else charging on in i'm waiting i'm waiting for the rest of the herd to realize what's going on and that they've been left behind and then theoretically from every other impala sighting that i've ever seen they'll start coming this way and even the wildebeest are slowly starting to move in the direction of the impala remember they look out for one another now paula um, I suppose, yes, certain antelope species can interbreed with a subspecies of one another, which is typically why, for instance, you can't have black and blue wildebeest. You just leave them alone and keep them separate. Um, I'm just trying to think what could mate with an impala. I don't know. But can I tell you a really interesting story? I don't know why this happened. It still boggles my mind. The one day when I was working in the Eastern Cape, actually I saw it more than once, and I wasn't the only person to see it either, so I wasn't going a little bit loopy, was a big and yala bull, which is in the Tragalafid family, as most of you know, so the same family as the bushbuck and the kudu. And this and yala was out in the open with a herd of impala that were grazing, and it was sort of coming into ratting season, and for some bizarre reason there was no impala ram with this group of ewes, but the Inyala bull, I kid you not, was, and I think I've told the story before, was walking behind and tasting a number of different ewes and phlegm and grimacing. They can't interbreed, but it was bizarre. I don't know why he had a problem finding a species of his own kind because there were so many in Yala around. So that was quite weird. I don't actually know how to explain that. Oh, look, the wildebeest are coming back now. See, they did. They followed the impala. Here they come. And I don't know if they were going to be going down to where they dam for a drink. Maybe they are. They normally start making their way up to the open areas by now. Well, there they are, just walking past the accommodations. It's, there's a same source whispering to me. He says there's a bucky, and a bucky, a bucky is not a swear word, I promise. It is a word that South Africans use to describe a pickup truck or a ute if you're from Australia. 
yeah, you say a ute. We don't. We say a bucky. That's that thing at the back over there. Bucky could also be a small container, a Tupperware, too. See, South African language is way too confusing. Um, so, yes, so that's the fence that we're telling you about. So that's where some of the other members of the Wild Earth team live, is in there. Isn't that nice? There's so many elephants that come through and pull down trees, almost breaking that fence. Not that that fence really keeps anything out, because we tend to leave the gate open all the time, so then the elephants and the hippos just walk on in. Remember that great story Brent loves to tell about, the time that the hippo tried to get into the swimming pool and was walking on the deck, <laughs> uh, which was quite funny. Um, so, yes, trying to get the hippo out must have been very entertaining, especially under the cover of darkness. Um, I wouldn't surprise me if a lion or a leopard hasn't poked its nose in there once or twice before. So we try and keep that gate closed, especially when Daryl the elephant is around. If Daryl the elephant, if you don't know who um, Daryl the elephant is, he's one of my favorite elephants. And there's a vid lots of videos of him all over the social media. We even did a safari life story on Daryl. Anyways, let's go to Brent who actually lives at this house and ask him to rejoice the hippo story. Well, I'm a bit sidetracked at the moment because I found some leopard tracks from during the day today uh, coming into Juma. There's also lion tracks, those are a bit older. And someone has driven over them, but they definitely weren't around this morning. It's a male leopard. Could be Hassana, could also be Tengana. Their footprints are quite similarly sized at the moment. But yes, I I, I, have, I reside at Ingers, and uh, I was there when the hippo wanted to climb into the swimming pool, and they went through the deck, and trying to we were trying to shoe him. But you've got to be quite scared, wary of shooing animals such as hippopotamus, because they can shoe you in half if you're not careful. But yes, we did manage to stop him getting into the pool, but unfortunately not stop him walking through the deck. Shame. That hippo is no more. He did not survive the drought. Ah, there we go. Thank you, McCurdy. She said she had lots of serious alarm calls around Gwari Pan, which is where we are, and she did see these tracks. These tracks are heading straight to Gwari Pan at this very moment. They are for a male. So I wonder if little Hassana has come to cause nonsense here. Let me just double check. Now there's, this is confusing now. There's lion tracks here, but the lion tracks look a little bit older. You can see the lions here. I'm just trying to find out where the leopard went. Boo! <laughs> no, I'm just joking. I was trying to give you all a fright. I think I failed. VM, did I fail? Did you get a fright, VM? A little bit. Yes. Okay. Now, at this time of the day, tracks become quite difficult to see. So, before I meander on... Just going to try make a hundred percent sure. Here we go. Where the leopard went. It looks like he might have gone this way. Let's double check. And they're tracking it in this low light. Can be a little bit tricky. But it's also good just to be stationary at this time of the day to stop. Um, it could be moving so might hear an alarm call. Let's do a loop around this block there. So we'll go down. Which way do we want to go? Let's go this way. Now, it's quite likely that whatever leopard this was it might have stopped for a drink here and then headed off into the block. So I'm just going to have a quick look around the pan. While we do that, let's go see what 
Jamesy's plans are for the rest of the evening. Well, Jamesy has just put his, uh, well, Jamie didn't, but um, Fergus did, just put the infrared light on in preparation for the darkness, which is uh, falling quite rapidly now as the clouds gather. We've come to round where Tandy, we thought, was yesterday. And so far. And I'm afraid that's all I can tell you right now. There is a birchal starling. Where will it land? Oh, good. Film the birchal starling there, Fergus. It's the one on top of the tree. Oh, some interesting colours behind it. Some blues and pinkish blues. Mm hmm. Looks almost black. Got an itchy ear. And it will be finding a roosting spot somewhere safe. Ideally, I mean, they nest in tree holes. A lot of birds don't spend any time in their nests other than for breeding. And I always think that I lived, if I lived in a tree hole as a bird, it's the first place I'd go at night. I wouldn't like to be out of my tree hole, warm tree hole nest in the night time. But I suspect it'll just find a piece of thick bush to go and sit in. I did see a Franklin scramble up. He didn't have any signal, I'm afraid. Scramble up into the top of a bush where I think it will remain for the night. Out of arm's way. These pans also been very quiet of late. Not much going on with them. I think the heat, you know, like I say, has come off the edge of the summer. And so not a great deal is very thirsty at the moment. But this would be the time that a leopard would come out and begin hunting, or a lion, or a hyena. We shall not try the last little one. Oh, apparently you're losing signal. I'm sorry about that. Let's go across to Brent. I'll find some more signal. Well, we've got those tracks now heading down Gwarri Pan Road. Sorry about that. It seems like Jamesy's found the gremlins, a lot of them today. We all have, but we will persevere. Now, as I say, this light tracking becomes quite difficult, so I'm very much concentrating and staring at the road. Now, what we are hoping for is a little bit of luck with hopefully an kudu just spotting the, the leopard starting to alarm call also because it's another species on our list how many mammal species we can get so I quite often like to do this I turn off the car and freewheel down the roads where it's possible so I can use my ears more so in that sort of half-light time of the day when spotlight isn't really that useful, let's have a look for tracks. So difficult in this light. You don't know whether the light of the cars is better or not. One day I hope to, that we have an electric electric cars. Imagine how amazing it'll be to drive around with it this quiet. You'll hear so much more. <laughs> it sounds like Taylor's decided to have herself a solo fireside chat. Sans fire. Ah, uh, uh, that's not true. I'm collecting the wood, Brent. I'm collecting. Here it is. Very nice. Get the fire started. Okay, hang on. Almost ready. It's going to be warm. <laughs> As Rebecca says, I'm not a dragon. I cannot blow fire out of my mouth. So we will not be having a fire. And I'm awaiting my questions. <laughs> 
<laughs> right, fireside chat fast five, everybody. I did also tweet. I did an illegal tweet while I was uh, I'm not, not alive because I'm still alive. Live. Oh, here we go. Whew. Right, Carol, first one's up. Have I ever seen porcupine here at fireside chat? On the barbecue? No, never. However, I have seen them running around before. I haven't seen a porcupine for a long time. The last time I may have seen one was possibly in the Mara being chased by the Olololo lions. Next. I don't know why I'm bobbing my head. Gareth, trick question. Where is the um, best area to see sable? I have, I'm lucky. The only time I have luck is when it comes to seeing sable. So I've actually seen them around Bergendal, I think that's how you say it. I have also seen them near Numbi Gate too. Um, I would imagine the large populations of sable would be further up north in Kruger, maybe like past Satara, down that way. But I've actually seen lots and lots of sable um, down in the southern sectors of Kruger. I just cannot remember what this one lookout point, and it's not a lookout point, it's a little copy, a little mountain thing of rocks. And I once saw a herd of maybe about 15 or 16 sable. It was really cool, and they were so relaxed and so close to the road. Okay, next. Trick, it was a trick question. You can see them anyway. Now, equalizer something I have not seen up here in the Sabi Sands, as Rebecca has just said, it is an aardvolf. Um, I've, I couldn't see why you wouldn't get them up here. I don't know if Brent or James have maybe seen them. Um, I don't actually know if their distribution moves up to this area, but I've seen aardvolf not too far away from here, about four hours drive slightly further north. So I can't imagine why they wouldn't be here. Maybe predator density. Possibly. We'll get back to you on that. We'll ask James and Brent. They've worked in the Sabi Sand for a long time. Next. <laughs> oh, Caitlin, I better get comfortable for this one. Seen as though you're wondering where my dream holidays. Please, no scorpions crawling out of the bark. Um, that's more comfortable. My dream holiday, Caitlin. There's a heart in the sky. Can you see that? Sorry. <laughs> Can you see the heart, Senzel? Or is it a Mickey Mouse? It's a heart. I'm going to go with a heart. I'm cloud watching for the rest of this afternoon. See, that's how much we all love each other. Even nature's telling us right now that's amazing. Um, now I'm trying to think of where my dream holiday would be. I'd like to go to maybe Madagascar. Or the Galapagos would be quite cool. I'd like to see animals that have no fear of anything. So the Galapagos could be quite cool. Uh, although I also want to go and see all the chameleon species in Madagascar. Or also Brazil. I'd like to travel everywhere. I don't have just one favorite place. I don't have a dream holiday. I want to, all, all the holidays are my dreams. Next. I can sit up now because I'm not talking about holidays anymore. Oh, yes. Saskia, Saskia, not Saskia, Saskia. Um, yes, there is definitely a risk of forest fires in the park. Uh, it's one of the reasons why we have to put in fire breaks. You often talk, hear us talking about driving along on fire breaks. Um, so basically we clear a section on the outskirts, typically on the boundaries of the property, and there'll be no vegetation whatsoever. So that if a fire does push in, it's got, it hits a, a section of about three or four meters probably a bit wider than that, and hoping that the fire then will just die down. They do a lot of back burning here to try and get rid of all the excess mori buns or all the buildup of trees that elephants have pushed out, all the leaves, all these different types of things. We try and get rid of that. Lightning is a massive problem, and then, of course, um, people breaking glasses and bottles, leaving the glass behind, whether it's on purpose or not, probably not on purpose. People throwing cigarette butts out, that's on purpose. Please don't do that. That's how you're going to start a fire. And I can't tell you how many lodges have burned down and lodges have almost been lost because of fighting fires. And we have to fight those fires. And it's not fun, fighting fires. Remember, it's very remote out here. So normally it's people on that are working at the lodges or part of the conservation teams that are, well trying to put those fires out. It's very dangerous. Right, we're going to have to start going home soon, but we'll probably do one more segment when we get a bit closer to camp. Um, but for now, I'm going to send you to James, and he's yielding a spotlight. <laughs> yes. I do have my spotlight out. Ooh, there's a southern white crowned shrike that has done what everything else has done today, Fergus. 
Hey, he's gone, yes. He's flown away, naturally. <laughs> anyway. I mean, it's all very well saying you shouldn't throw a cigarette butt out of the car. You shouldn't be smoking in the car, full stop. Well, you shouldn't be smoking. End of story. Russen, you want to know if I have ever had to fight a fire in the bush? Russen, I have fought many fires in the bush. I found it one of the most exhilarating activities I ever did. One of them I caused myself. Um, <laughs> I won't tell you that story. But another one, or many others, you know, we've got have to get heavily involved and all the lodges come together. And <laughs> I think I have told the story before, but we... <laughs> We had a big fire at Londolosi once. And, I mean, you wait around August, September time, you watch the southern horizon to see what's coming. And this monstrous thing came out of the south. And so everyone, the alarm was raised, everyone got in and started lighting fire breaks. And I was coordinating the thing. Very inexperienced I was at the time. <laughs> and... These people arrive very kindly from a lodge that shall remain nameless. And they arrived with, uh, with, a, <laughs> with what looked like sort of ghostbuster suits on. And one of my friends who was helping with the fighting the fire, is now the general manager at Londolosi, uh, he said to them, he has a sense of humor quite similar to mine, uh, he, he, said, he said, is that so that you can serve hot chocolate to those of us who are actually fighting this fire? which they were very offended by. They had these sort of backpacks on with a pumping handle. And I don't know if you have it in sports events where you are, uh, but in this country you can go to watch the cricket or the rugby and these guys will come past with backpacks full of steaming hot chocolate or uh, coffee or glühwein if you're very lucky, and they'll pump the thing and then fill your glass up. Anyway, that's what these guys were wearing. And no, they were very insulted. They had special fire sludge in the back, in their backpacks. The problem was that the fire sludge only sprayed about two feet from the front of the nozzle, which meant that in the face of a blazing inferno, they would have to have been ignited themselves before they managed to bring their fire gel, specialized fire gel, to bear on any kind of flame. So they were utterly useless, but we appreciated having them around. We got the fire out. In fact, the night time took the fire out. If you can keep a fire at bay until night, it really is much, hard, much easier to fight a fire when the temperature drops and often the wind drops in the night as well. A fire needs wind, temperature and fuel. And if those thing, three things combine, which they often do in September, and you can see that this grass is very long now and well, I'll continue the story when I've we've gone over to Brent. I think he's got something in IR. Well, we haven't given up on our mammal list yet, and we have a little grey diker in infrared. So, what is this? This is number eight, a female diker. Monkeys were seven. Number eight is a little female diker. Isn't that? Beautiful. Now, much more relaxed than during the day because we normally they disappear at a rate of knots. And uh, dike are, are quite nocturnal in their feeding habits. So they tend to be a little bit more relaxed at night. And see, so she's listening very intently. And of course, could be a leopard close by. So it pays to be very attentive. Now she turned her head there. You saw some little glands on the side of her nose. Let's see if she does it again. There we go. And uh, she'll scent mark with those. Hey, little one. Looks like she's going to sneak off a little wagging tail and carry on on her nocturnal feeding. Now we are in infrared and that's why the picture is coming out in black and white. And uh, well, we're going to leave the little diker and uh, keep moving and hopefully find a little leopard. 
So in the meantime, let us go. Oh, I'm sorry, I interrupted you, Jamesy. Let's go back to James so he can finish his story. Well, at least Brent had an animal to show you. That was much more important than my fire story. Um, I think I was saying it was temperature, uh, temperature, <laughs> fuel, and wind. There we go. Those three things combined. Oh, yes, now I know exactly how I was going to finish the story. Uh, and it is in September, October, when the, it gets very hot. After a rainy year like this, and you can see all around us relatively long grass, and this is going to be a fire hazard come August and September. The rains come. And so you'll find that we'll have to be quite careful about burning fire breaks in the winter. That's when we normally do it, sort of June, July. We'll burn fire breaks around the camp so that if a fire, a fire does come, the camps aren't threatened. But I would say, unlike last year and the year before, when there was no fire hazard because there was just no grass around, uh, come the 2018 fire season of August and September and into October, we could have some real danger this year. Magic Dragon Wizard, you'd think with a name like that that you'd know all things. Um, <clears throat> you want to know how scarce are animals are after a fire? Depends on the animal, obviously. Animals don't stay away, but obviously if they're grazers, there's nothing for them to eat until the green flush comes, which is, if there's moisture in the soil, will be fairly soon afterwards. You know, a couple of days to a week or so, there will be a flush. There's a bird on the ground there, Fergus. Um, and so you'll find that you'll have huge concentrations of grazers on burnt areas as soon as that first green flush happens. But until that happens, no, you won't find much at all. There is a forked-tailed drongo. Now, this has an interesting little memory for me. The first time I noticed that forked-tailed drongos like to sit on the road in the very, very last light of the day. I was living not too far from here up in a place called Palaboa. And I used to go running in the evening. It wasn't actually in the town, which is quite possibly the most unattractive town in South Africa. I was in a rural area, and I used to go running around about this time, and I'd come back home in the last light, and there would be the drongos, all of them, all through the Mapani woodland on the road. And I still don't really know why it is that they do this. It must be for eating. What was that? Oh, yes, I think it's hohos. They're looking for for little bugs and insects to eat. But they will go and roost. I mean, they're not nocturnal, so it's only at this very last, or during, during the last embers of the day, that they will sit on an open patch like this and wait for things to come past. And it's only they that do it. A very interesting behavior. We too are now in infrared, are we, Fergus? Yes. And that's why your picture is black and white. In case you were wondering, you can stop shaking your television or your uh, smart TV. Yes. Or checking the date to check that it's not 1968. One of only three black birds that occur here. The other being the black flycatcher, and the one, last one being the black cuckoo shrike. Leah, yes we have. We've had very nice birds today. You say we've had awesome birds. I agree, we've had a good time on the bird front. And that's quite unusual on a windy day like we've had today. But very pleasant. I wish he'd do something so I could try and figure out what he's... No, not not like fly away. Like, tell, show me what you're doing. Anyway, that was the forktail drongo on the road. Let's continue. All right, Brent Leo Smith, who loves a spotlight, probably far more than I do, uh, would like to spot something with it for you now.
Well, I'm hoping so. I think James doesn't like the spotlight because it's like this. He, he's got to sort of try to see over the wheel and shine the spotlight with his arm up. Jamie also has to, whether his eye, I can just sort of sit normally and carry on shining the spotlight. Uh, we're still hoping for a last minute leopard. Uh, we're doing a block around, it uh, was loop around the block. Oh, there we go. There's number nine, Vim. Scrub hair. So we've got to Vim's uh, number nine. The VM thought we were only going to see nine different species, or they disappeared, the little scrubbies. And then there they are. Right next to... Oh, don't run away too far. Oh, he's disappeared. Behind the little bush. Okay. Um, so that's nine mammal species. Are we going to break to ten? Uh, the most elusive animal in Juma. Who's that? Jane, I was asking. Probably pangolin. Um, or actually Zorilla. I've definitely seen more pangolins in the Sabi Sands than I've seen uh, polecats. So I've only seen polecat once. And uh, that was coming when Tristan and Ali were still working at Sibambili. Uh, Jamie and I went for dinner with them there and on our way back uh, we saw we saw a, a striped polecat in the road. Um, pangolin? Pangolin or polecat? What do you think, Vim? Oh, polecat, yeah. Caracal, I mean, they're all quite quite scarce and whatnot, but I think polecat is definitely something you don't see as often here. Oh, there we go, bush baby them. Oh, no, it's jumping too fast. Where'd he go? There, I can see the eyes. Just trying to find a, a gap through the trees. That would have been number 10, but we didn't get him on camera. So it doesn't count, does it, Vim? Oh dear. Maybe we'll get lucky with another bush baby. No, he's still there. I see him there, Vim. And you just see his eye. Oh, uh, that terminalia is in a terrible spot. He's going up. He might pop his head out a little bit higher, Vim. Yeah. So they on that left hand sort of there we go somewhere in there. Where are you? Where are you, little bush baby? Oh, he's gone down. Oh, there's more than one. There's another one coming through. See that shot? There we go. There we go. He saw an eye. Oh, we saw a moving branch. There we go. He's out in the open, a little bit down. There, there, no, you got him. Right there. So centre frame. There we go, bush baby. Yay! Hello, little guy. That's number 10. Oh, there's a couple of them. There's like two or three in that little uh, weeping wattle. Oh, they're so sweet. Oh, see, there's another one just dropped off to the right. Getting ready for a busy night of hunting insects. They've just, just woken up as it's got dark off and into the thickets it goes. Bye-bye, little one. Thank you for making an appearance and getting us our tenth mammal species of the, of the, of the drive. Okay, yay! I'm tired. Now we need the leopard for 11. Rebecca runs 11 leopards. Jeez. Not demanding at all, Rebecca. I'll take one leopard rather than 11 at the moment. Uh, now, we, we seem to be having quite a lot of luck with our spotlight. We found diker and bush baby and scrub hair. Unfortunately, it seems like James is not having as much luck. Let's go find out what his plans are. Yes, I've spotted some fruits in a tree. Beautiful, large fruited bush willow. Ha! <laughs> Look at that, hey? Combretum zaire. Wow. Are you amazed, Fergus? So amazed. Beautiful. They look like chameleons. That's how I spotted them. Very good. You know, Leah Smith is definitely thrashing me on the mammal front. Uh, we did see a scrub here, we didn't show it to you. 
Uh, we so we have had. Oh, we saw some Steenbok as well. So even those that we didn't, even if we count the ones we haven't shown you, uh, we still aren't even close. We've had Impala and Warthog, Waterbuck. We did see a Diker that ran away, Steenbok that ran away, Bunny that ran away. That's six. The yeah, Smith is on four, on ten. I'm not sure what that means. Oh, right, okay. I get it now. Um, right, so, uh, this is the time of the night when I need to tell you and encourage you and beg with you and plead with you to please vote for us on the Webbies, if you don't know what the Webbies are. The Webbies apparently are the equivalent of the Oscars or Emmys, but for the Web. And so you can vote for us on the Webbies. We've been nominated for three categories. Uh, apparently some Basset Hound is beating us in one of those categories. I'm not sure what this Basset Hound achieves during the day uh, to make him so successful in the Webbies, but he is beating us in one category. So please go along. All you do is go to our Facebook page, you'll find the post on the Webbies, and then you just click on Webbies, and then you vote for us. Please. And then we will become rich and famous. If you win the Webbies, maybe you win a computer or an iPod. No, you don't, they don't make iPods anymore. Um, I, I don't know what happens. Anyway, it would be very nice. It would be prestigious. Maybe we'll stick a sticker on our vehicle that says we beat the Basset or something like that. Victoria, you ask a very salient question. You say, why are there no headlights on the vehicle? The answer is that I turned them off. I, I'm not sure why I turned them off. I think there was something on the road. Anyway, they're back on now. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for pointing that out to me. I hadn't even noticed. I drove into a police roadblock once uh, on, in, in the evening. Because in Johannesburg, they have set up roadblocks to stop drunk drivers. I was most pleased with myself because I hadn't had anything to drink and I was looking forward to blowing into a breathalyzer. Uh, and the chap said, I'm writing you a ticket for 500 rand. And I said, but I haven't drunk anything. He said, no, but you didn't have your lights on. So I'd been driving around in the darkness of Johannesburg without my lights on, which wasn't very Anyway, I don't think I paid the fine. I did pay the fine, in case anyone from the traffic department's watching. I paid it, immediately. Phew. It's close. All right, let's go back across to Brent Leo Smith. He's had his lights on all night. Uh, well, he has told us that he is a much better driver. Uh, than me and everyone else, and so the evidence would show that he is. <laughs> what nonsense is James talking now? I just said I could see over the steering wheel more easily. Uh, oh, lots of scrub hairs around, but we are trying to find some more species. Now, we just had that wonderful sighting of a bush baby. Hello, little scrub here. Nope, sorry. I'll wait for them to find it. Whoa, look at that jump. He got a fright. <laughs> you can see how incredibly agile they were. I think a bug flew into him and he just leapt straight up in the air. Silly thing. Now, Vim and I were just discussing, we think... I'm trying to work out, on average, how many scrub hairs get eaten a day. I think a lot. I'd say, I'd say at least one per leopard per day is a good one, on average. A wild dog pack, probably four or five per day. And not, not forgetting everything else, the uh, birds of prey, the owls. I'd say, I reckon, throughout the Sabi Sands, I'd say close on more than a hundred scrub hairs get eaten a day. What do you think, Fiam? And there's a lot. I mean, we've seen seven or eight already, and, and not in a long distance. Wow, uh, it's got a split ear. I didn't even notice that. 
Um, turn around. Definitely has a split in its left ear. There we go. It probably escaped some bird of prey or something. Oh, stopping for a snack. Yum, 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 yum. Oh, off you go, little scrub hair. Watch out for the leopards. Uh, now, we did see a, a bush baby a little bit earlier. Uh, no, Rowan, they are not related to koalas uh, at all. Koalas are marsupials. Uh, we don't have any marsupials in Africa. So, no, they are not. They are small primates. Uh, they're related to slow lorises and, um, well, other Galego species. Now, you will notice that we do switch our lights off quite often, and that's uh, to not blind certain animals and that. And so when we turn the lights off, they tend to move out of the road. Now, the bush babies have a very varied diet, Gizmo. So um, they are insectivores. They, are also fruit, uh, they also eat fruits, um, and, but mostly insects. Uh, they'll even eat certain flowers. Uh, but mostly the, the little bush babies are insectivores and so they eat a very wide variety uh, of of nocturnal and uh, insects uh, they have quite set territories and they urinate on their hands and feet and so as they move along their territory uh, they're able to scent mark on the go so to speak by using their hands as they go so they're constantly are scent marking. They live in little family groups, so you can, in, in a little hole, you can sometimes have up to six or seven bush babies all cuddled up together. And uh, there's a few spots. I actually haven't checked the bush baby uh, nests for a while. And I'll do that tomorrow night um, down in the, in, the, in the west of Juma. There's a, one that they used to frequent. Now, a lot of those little holes are used by quite a few different animals over a period. Uh, birds, genets, bush babies, uh, rock monitors will all utilize the same hole. And it just depends who's in, in residence at the moment. Now, one of the, the biggest predators of bush babies is actually rock monitors. And they'll try to seek out the babies in those holes and eat them. Now, we had a, at, a, at our house in Hootsbrate, Jamie and I had a lovely family of about, there must have been about six of them, little bush babies, a mom, dad, and all the, the little offspring. And they used to come out of the, the roof every evening. But then uh, the big rock monitor was constantly trying to get at them. Now, strange enough, so we have tenants in, in, our, in our house at the moment, and uh, they are not bush people. Uh, they do work for the, 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 the military in the area. There's a big military base outside Hoodsbrake. They're contractors. Uh, so a company's renting the house from us. And we just, Jamie had just arrived in Kenya and we got an email from our estate agent. Um, it was quite a funny email because she was letting us know that the tenants were, were, were obviously not bush people because uh, they had sent a complaint that there was a crocodile in the roof. Now, of course, it was just a very big rock monitor lizard. Now, he is a bit of a pain. I mean, just before I moved to Kenya, I thought I'd stopped his his route into the roof. So Tristan was actually helping me out. We had got chainsaws and we climbed up the trees and um, cut down the branches. And Jamie shouting because we nearly broke one of the windows. So, <laughs> uh, and uh, I was up sitting on a tree branch cutting it with a chainsaw and then the branch started breaking while I was on it. That was quite scary. But... Uh, but yeah, so lots of different creatures utilize, oh, what was that, nah, um, these holes, and I'm hoping that was going to be a leopard around the pan, but no such luck. No tracks. I'm hoping tomorrow morning when we've got a nice blank canvas uh, of tracks from, from the night, we'll have a bit more luck. Oh, another scrub here. As I say, that's probably, if I start counting, that's probably number 20, no, probably not quite 20 yet, but at least number 15 that I've seen in the, in the, since we saw the first one just after dark.
Now, remember, or not only do we want to take you on, on explorations through the African bush in day and night, we also want to take you underwater, hopefully day and night as well. So remember to go check out our Dive Alive Kickstarter campaign and uh, be one of the lucky people who can enjoy the private, dry, uh, pri pri private dives. Uh, when we launch, um, make sure you don't miss out and you're one of the first to enjoy that amazing experience of the oceans live. Now, I love the oceans and uh, well, I'll go visit the dive live camps, but I'm going to go visit them to go fishing. <laughs> I, I, I'm not a big diver. Um, I, will, I can dive, but I've always chosen to go fishing instead of diving. I do love my fishing. I want to go catch some big GTs this year. I think that's on the cards. Tristan and I are also talking about trying to plan a tiger fishing trip. Because Tristan's never been tiger fishing. And it is one of my favorite types of fishing. And uh, I used to be a a fishing guide up on the Zambezi River so and I know that part of the world very well when it comes to catching the striped water dog what is that Vim? is it too far? let me just put that down like that Inyala yep Inyala you can just see the horns Darn it, I thought maybe there was a leopard walking down the Mawati. Wouldn't that have been wonderful? Uh, now, <laughs> there's an interesting one from the Lorax. I hippos and whales related. I. Uh, Probably as much as whales and human beings are related in the fact that they're both mammals. Um, I'm just trying to think. Not that I know of. Um, of course, everything's related if you go far enough back. But I don't think there is a, is a close relation between hippo and whales. Oh, sorry, Vim. I hit that a bit fast. Let me change gear. Now, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to guess to 11 species. And I've only got seven minutes. And I'm hoping that those wildebeest are still on quarantine uh, to get to us one more species. And of course, the more ground we cover, the more chance we have to have species. We haven't given up on the leopard front yet. We still sort of are on the peripheries of where that leopard might have got to. And uh, one of the reasons I like night drive so much and, and my spotlight so much is that um, Yes, sometimes they are very, very quiet, the night drives, and you don't see much, and you just see me flashing about my spotlight. But you've got a chance to, to see some really interesting little mammals, and particularly little carnivorous mammals. And about 75 of your more interesting mammal species only come out at night. And I'm talking about your little things like genets, uh, honey badgers, art fark, uh, pangolin, uh, what else am I missing there? Vim, caracal, serval, uh, sorry, gerbils, gerbils bushfelt gerbils. Actually, I know where there's a, a the bushfelt gerbil uh, nest uh, or hole. So maybe we might even catch a bushfelt gerbil before the end of safari. I'm gonna, I'm gonna head there. It's on the way to quarantine. Uh, now let's go see what James enjoys about the African night. I enjoy the silence of the African night. Uh, well, it's not that silent, but it's a difference of sound. It's a, it's a, just a very peaceful sound, unless, of course, you happen to have a lion savaging a buffalo outside your room, in which case it isn't a very peaceful sound at all. But I like the sounds of the night and their sort of quiet peace, contemplative peace. And if we do get lucky and find interesting things out here at night time, it really is great. Bush babies, for example. There's a chameleon. Is it? Yes, it is. <laughs> or chameleons, for example. Hurrah! Yeah. 
Can you believe it, Fergus? There we go. I've spotted 7,000 chameleons today. All of them turned out to be the fruit of the large fruited bush willow. But there we have an actual flat-necked chameleon, just near home. And I guess as the winter continues, so they will retreat further and further into the middle of the bushes, where they will estivate and wait for warmer times. You do still see them in winter, but not obviously as commonly as you do in summer. Somebody told me once that the chameleons hanging out on the edges of the branches of the females and the males hang out in the middle. They couldn't tell me why that was the case, and so I dismissed it uh, with the contempt I believe it deserves. Anyway, there we go. Nice little flat neck chameleon. That one's about three inches long. Very good. Very good. The other thing I like about the night, of course, is the stars. I find the stars deeply fascinating and, um, well, it's great to give a sort of perspective of our insignificance in the universe. When you consider the distances, sizes, numbers, it really is quite astonishing when you stare up at the Milky Way, which is billions of stars, knowing that those billions of stars form a galaxy that is just one of many billions of other galaxies, which is really just quite astonishing. Those are numbers that we can't honestly contemplate. Anybody who says they understand what a billion looks like, uh, I don't think has any clue. And a billion billion, well, that's just ridiculous. It's a fun. Right, we're going across the dam wall, slowly making our way towards home. Maybe there will be something having a drink. A late evening tipple. Emil, you want to know if all mammals see shadows, is that correct? No, Emil, vampires don't see shadows, and they're mammals. Uh, they are unable to see shadows. Uh, but other than vampires, I'm pretty sure that all mammals would be able to see shadows, yes. I can't see a reason why they wouldn't. Any animal that is able to s distinguish light from dark would we will be able to see a shadow. A shadow is, of, after all, just a blocking of the light. So I'm going to say yes, all animal mammals can see shadows. All right, let's go across to Brent Leo, mammal hunter. He is on the trail of number 11 approaching quarantine. We've got, it looks actually like a shrew rather than a gerbil. Oh, what do you think? Forward a bit, Liam. Yeah. It actually looks more like a little shrew. Oh, there he goes, there he goes. Well, we don't, oh, he's behind the pole <laughs> to Murphy's Law. He's trying to sneak away from us, a tiny little shrew. He's going to pop out there in that little, there. Is it a shrew? I can't see. No, it's not a shrew. It is a little gerbil. It's just a juvenile gerbil. Oh, there we go. That's 11. A number 11. Uh, so we got there, and we didn't have to do it with the wildebeest, unfortunately. Sorry, wildebeest. We didn't get to the wildebeest. But uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us. It has been uh, a bit quiet, but hopefully tomorrow we're going to be able to bring out the big cats in force. I've had a thoroughly good time on Drive with you, and I'm sure James and Taylor have as well. Can't wait to do it all again tomorrow morning. So from all of us, it's Fari Live. Toodaloo, bye, bonwee, ciao, and all the rest.